Hey guys, uh, hello, 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 welcome to, well, episode 73 of Van Gogh Letters. This one's going to be pretty interesting. I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes talking about this article, um, 10 surprises in um, Van Gogh's Starry Night. I'll put a link to that in, in chat if you don't like my face and you don't like my voice and you're new to the channel you can just go and read that on your own time and i think you'll probably find it quite interesting so if you would prefer to deal with this in your own time off you go have fun <laughs> now the reason why i've said there's six surprises is i don't find all 10 of these terribly surprising i find some of them um kind of ordinary but some of them are certainly very surprising one of the things that to me is not surprising and i'm not sure if i would agree with is the first one moonshine in the wrong direction um you know he seems to be suggesting that the moon is that's the moon and that it's creating shadows over there it's just not something that to me um I don't know, just um, if you look at this painting here, I mean, you could make the argument that, that that's the moon and that is some other kind of celestial object. This is also quite an interesting photo because that was how I imagined, I don't know about you guys, if you've gone to the um, uh, Museum of Modern Art, um, that was how I imagined seeing Starry Night. I imagined going into the museum and, you know, looking at everything. And of course, it wasn't like this at all. It was, there was like a whole, it was almost like there was a celebrity in the room and everyone was clamoring to take photos of Taylor Swift or whatever. And so I've, I've gone to, as far as I can remember, I've seen Starry Night twice, and both times the room was absolutely packed. Um, you couldn't really get very close to it. So, you know, you, you've traveled from around the world, and then when you get there, you sort of feel like you can only get a glimpse of it. Thanks a lot, Robbie Robin. Yeah, it was definitely packed. Um, Jelsea, when you were there, was it like this or, or was it, um, emptier? So let's have a look at what, uh, Lamtoon said earlier. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, thanks for your comment. Lamtoon says the biggest surprise I learned was that he painted while in the asylum. That's um probably something that may have come out during van gogh letters that that to me is also not that surprising now but i suppose when i learned it was quite surprising um uh yeah so that is part of the surprise that i want to share with you theo and vincent were pretty disappointed with it I imagine painting one of the most celebrated artworks and you know, it's hanging in a museum in a tower, essentially, in Manhattan, in New York. One of the most expensive cities in the world. It's traveled all the way across the Atlantic. And the artist himself wasn't terribly happy with it. People are going goo goo gaga over it. But um, the, the guy who wrote, ooh, ooh, the guy who almost said wrote it, the guy who painted it, is not thrilled with it. Imagine that. Well, Jelsey says, when I was there, there were only about five people there. Well, you're pretty lucky. Maybe I should try some other time. Okay, so anyway, let's go back to this. I'm going to highlight the aspects that I found interesting. So first of all, this is the actual window that he painted Story Night from. So he actually didn't only paint Starry Night, he, he, he painted the window itself. 
And one wonders whether the design of the window, if you look at the window, the window's got kind of an arc over there, right? And it the window itself breaks light into quadrants, right? There's well that's a that's a arc and a semicircle. This is a um uh, rectangle on its side with smaller squares or rectangles and then there's even a, I think a lattice work on the outside you can kind of see how it fragments the light that's coming from outside right now if you think about some of these shapes and then you think about starry night um, you know what was was the framing through which he saw it any kind of inspiration for for it it's itself just something to think about but anyway that is the window through which he saw um sorry night and and effectively just like a prison window right effectively he is in a an asylum he can't just really come and go as he pleases he's um you know he's, he's in a sense a prisoner yeah, I mean, those do look like bars on the window, don't they? So th that's quite interesting. Then did you know that there was a drawing of Starry Night? That's the drawing. And what you don't necessarily see in Starry Night is the um, these tendrils of, of smoke going, you know, going up from the chimneys. Uh, and then joining the swirls in the sky. Yeah, you know, do you do you see that as clearly? Also, the the cypress tree is, is almost more of a flaming creature than um, than you see in the painting. It's far far less vertical and far more kind of bubbling and bursting than than the painting itself, the final painting. Now, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a, a, a black flame. Um, and anyway, so if you go from this to the painting, you can see um, it's slightly different. You certainly don't see those swirls of chimney smoke. And this tree is a little bit more settled. So to read the script here, let me... Um, put myself in the picture. Van Gogh made drawn copies of 10 or so paintings in the summer of 1889, including Starry Night. This drawing was donated to the Kunststoller Bremen in 1918, but was lost during the chaos of the Second World War. It was looted at a German castle where it had been sent for safekeeping by a Red Army officer who took it back to the Soviet Union on a tractor. Back in 1992, I was the first outsider to see the drawing, so somehow it did survive, which was then in the secret storeroom of the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. So the sketch of Story Night ended up in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and the painting ended up in Manhattan. Can you imagine if, if they went the, it was the opposite? The Russian government refused to res, uh, restitute the looted Van Gogh and it was transferred the Ministry of Culture store in Moscow, where it languishes, and I guess it's still there today. Now, to me, this is where it gets really interesting. And again, this is um, from an article, 10 Surprises about Van Gogh's Story Night, um, in the art newspaper. And so, so I would put number one being this this drawing, I would put number two, um, just this idea that it was a failure, was Story Night a failure, right? And it, it's really interesting when you think about success, um, sometimes when something appears to be a success in the present, it seems very straightforward, it seems very plain, it seems very obvious, and yet, at the time something is executed, success is far more mysterious, far more difficult, right? 
Anyway, so the article goes, Vincent had ambivalent feelings about the painting, initially referring to it as a study, although a few weeks later it hung in his studio. Realizing that Story Night marked something of a departure, Vincent warned Theo that the composition might appear an exaggeration, not a realistic landscape. In other words, expressionism. When Theo received it in Paris, and this is quite interesting, what is Theo's reaction to it? You can kind of understand the artist being a little bit unsure of himself. You know, he's, he is where he is. He, he is where he is sans ear. And how did Theo feel about it? And so uh, Theo responded with a few carefully chosen words of mild criticism. And can you imagine if Theo hadn't seen it yet and had perhaps responded to the sketch, maybe Van Gogh would never have sent it to him. And then um, he, was, he added that the search for style takes away the real sentiment of things. So I guess he was saying that, you know, you're trying to find your, your voice. You're trying to find a way to express yourself, and that has interfered with the real sentiment of the thing that you're trying to do. And look where we are today, where Story Night itself is a sentiment that has caught on so much with people, right? In November 1889, so quite a few months later, we, we only at late January in the Van Gogh Letters timeline, but in November, Vincent wrote his artist friend, Emile Bernard, saying that the painting was a setback, right? Adding that once again, I'm allowing myself to do stars too big. And so months later, he thought of Starry Night as a setback. Can you imagine if um, someone could have traveled through time and said, this is going to be your most famous painting. Maybe you should try and do something like that again. Now, now, if I may, I, I'd like to share, well, sorry, I actually forgot to take off this image. I wonder if I can do that now. That, sorry, that was a little bit of a mistake. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. A little, little bit in a rush to do this. So you can actually see if you look at this picture over here. Can you see over here? This picture or that picture is similar to the picture you see right in front of you. So Starry Night is kind of behind um, my, my face. It's sort of somewhere around here, right? And can you see all the pe people behind me? Uh, am I in the way? But th there are a lot of people behind me. So, so this image was actually taken in, um, in that room. Just want to see if I've got any others I can share. Um, how about this one? So there you can see, um, if I just take this away. Uh, sorry. Uh, there you can see that's a picture I took in the room of, you know, with Story Night. And the, the room is literally just packed with people. And I seem to remember being asked to because I sort of put my hand over the line and someone actually told me that I must not do that. So there was also a little bit of a police presence in the, in, in the room as well. So, but it's quite interesting that, you know, right now, you know, you go to the museum and, and this is the star of the show, excuse the pun. And yet when he painted it, he thought of it as a setback. And, you know, the other thing to bear in mind is Van Gogh, had, Van Gogh basically died just 
more than a year after he painted this painting. So if you consider this painting the triumph of his life, the triumph of his career, the, the zenith of his artistic journey, you know, he died a year later. Can you imagine if he lived another 5, 10, 15, 20 years? No, he died at the age of 37. Um, can you imagine if he lived as long, long as Dr. Gachet? Uh, was long. I think his mother also lived quite long. Can you imagine if he lived, say, another 30 or 40 years? I mean, can you imagine producing this painting behind me and then you have another 30 years to produce something else? And I mean, he produced 70 paintings in 70 days the following year, of which there were some pretty incredible artworks like Weed field with crows, which I've actually got hanging in my bedroom. Obviously, not the original, but nevertheless. So, I think um, another way to think about this is could it have been possible for Starry Night to have always been kind of ignored and or, or, or let's put it this way if Van Gogh thought of it as a setback if Theo thought it wasn't that great could it have been possible that the world didn't take any notice as well and I, and I think this article so in other words words added to that narrative I think made a huge difference right this article here so what I'm trying to say is without this narrative developing around the painting, I don't know whether the artwork itself would have gotten the legs, gotten the traction, gotten the attention that it ultimately did. It's easy to say in hindsight, yeah, no, it's a really interesting painting. It's a really good painting. It's really creative. But you must bear in mind at the time Van Gogh couldn't sell anything including this painting. I mean, it, it's not like he painted Starry Night and the next day someone came and bought it. He painted Starry Night and, and no one bought it. And then and the next month, no one bought it. And no one bought it for the entire rest of the year. And then the next year, no one bought it either. And then Van Gogh died and then still nobody bought it. And so, you know, when did somebody realize, well, this is actually quite a nice painting? Well, possibly as a result of this article. And this article reads as follows. Well, um, it, it touches on, um, uh, let's just have a look. Well, let me just read what it says here. Octave Mirbo, a writer and critic, saw Story Night in 1891, right? So a year after Van Gogh's death, somebody saw it and then he wrote about the Dutchman's admirable madness of skies. Now you must remember part of Van Gogh's narrative at that point was that that he's this mad artist to cut off his ear. That was the original story and so when when you take that right you take that idea this guy doesn't have an ear and you combine it with with starry night then it's almost like the the, the gift of the mad artist that that, that um, you know artists can be eccentric but sometimes there's genius in madness right and so that seems to be what he's seeing it's almost like the starry night is is um is a um expression of the own artist madness and it is actually quite a accurate that's quite an accurate assessment meaning van gogh was actually painting his own state of mind in other words in the violence of the stars in the um churning of the of the night i think he was expressing his own disquiet he was expressing his own I wouldn't say madness, but simply things like anxiety and his feelings of um, feeling unsettled. Uh, you know, earlier that year, he was saying how he couldn't sleep at night because 
you know, you can imagine if you've lost your ear and you try and put that side of your head on a pillow, it's going to be a little bit painful. But not only that, the, the pain itself, the throbbing of the ear um, is going to make sleeping difficult. But he was struggling with insomnia in January. And, you know, he was up very early in the morning. This isn't really a midnight sky. This is the, a very early morning, just pre-dawn sky. And it suggests that Van Gogh couldn't actually sleep, got up early, and he executed this particular painting. So describing it as this madness that is being executed on canvas is not, I wouldn't say it's accurate, but it's, it's kind of on the right track. It is expressing a kind of um, perspective. And of course, in 1890, it, it was it was just 1880, 1890. It it was just becoming um, knowledge that that the heavens were spiral galaxies. You know, telescopes were being um, improved, and so in a way, what he was painting there was a very modern view of um, space that um, stars didn't just, weren't just little pinpricks, they, they moved across the heavens and um, they contained systems and, and, you know, that sort of thing. So um, it was quite an um, interesting um, attempt to draw the heavens, um, probably in a way that hadn't been, been done before. The other thing that's just interesting to note is Van Gogh is actually trying to paint night. And if you think about it, it's, it's not a very dark painting. The only thing that's really dark is the tree. But it's somehow executed in a way that still feels like night, but it's, it's a very bright painting nevertheless. I've actually got um, a canvas print of it right next to me here. And so, you know, he does manage to, can you see? He does manage to, although it's a night scene, um, he does manage to execute it in a way that is, is quite brilliant, instead of just making it a dark scene. And so it's thanks to this article that um, someone started to take the idea of imagination and talk about it. And it is quite exciting. It talks about drunken stars spinning and tottering, spreading and stretching into scruffy comet's tails. Suddenly this um, almost, I don't want to say dreary, I just mean dreary from the perspective of someone painted this from an asylum. You know, um, Theo might be thinking of the painting from in terms of where it was coming from, where someone else is now thinking of it in a, maybe in a slightly different way. Anyway, so he went on to write, after seeing this painting, after knowing about this madness, he was then inspired the following year to write In the Sky. And it was published in this French uh, newspaper, there it is, right? And the the narrative was basically about a tragic artist who paints trees with their branches twisted and landscapes under whirling stars. So he's basically refashioning the Van Gogh narrative into the narrative of the mad, the classic narrative of the mad artist, the tortured artist. And I mean, this, this ends up being on the front page of a major French newspaper. And so you can imagine then it really catches on this idea of this artist who goes crazy and he starts seeing strange things and, and painting them. And then ultimately it ends with a horrific scene in which the artist saws off his right hand with a hacksaw and then dies. 
And so the novel's main theme is the link between genius and insanity, right? A little bit like um, who is the guy who um, was responsible for the Manhattan Project? Uh, what is his name again? Anyone remember? I'm just, funny enough, I had Oppenheimer. It's a little bit like Robert Oppenheimer, someone seen as a genius, but also perhaps um, disturbed in some ways, right? Uh, hi, um, hi there in Australia. So when do you think Story Night was bought? When do you think the painting was acquired for the first time? Uh, let me um, put you on the right track. Uh, his ear was completely cut off. I'll show you a, a sketch of that. Um, I have written a book about it, so that's why I'm why I know this. Um, so there you can see uh, the kind of track where the ear was cut off. So yeah, it is most of the ear. Not quite sure what happens if I click play here. So there's the um, original document. That's the amount of ear that was left over, right? A, just a tiny little part of the ear lobe, and most of the ear was basically sliced off. Ironically, the part that was left behind it would probably have been the easiest to cut off, um, and the part that was removed would probably be the hardest to take off. So if you guys want to look at that, I'll put a link in chat. So again, when do you think someone bought Starry Night? When, who do you think was the first buyer of Starry Night? Do you think it was bought before 1900? Do you think it was bought after 1900? But, but before 1910? Or do you think it was bought after 1910? What do you guys think? Okay. So it was actually bought in 1907, so um, about how many years is it? Um, just trying to think. It's about uh, 15 years after that article came out in um, 1892. And one does what can't help but imagine that this 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 novel um, must have must have got people thinking and talking about it, and um, and so it took about fifteen years for the um, penny to drop, so to speak. And if you think about it, that is a heck of a long time. Someone didn't just write this article. And in 1893, someone bought the painting. It still took 15 years after this big kind of publicity to for, for there to be um, some kind of result. So 
you know, it shows you just what a, what a slow start Van Gogh's work was getting. It was getting a start, but it's certainly a slow one. And so what happened was a Dutch woman, a woman from Rotterdam, Georgette von Stolk, she bought Starry Night and she bought it from Theo's widow and she kept the painting in her conservatory. It appears to have escaped damage from sunlight or damp. She apparently even hung a protective curtain in front of it on hot days. And this is the part that I think is almost the most incredible, is that the Museum of Modern Art got Starry Night in a swap. Right? Have a look at this. So how did, Van, how did uh, Starry Night go from Rotterdam to Amsterdam? Uh, sorry, um, uh, what's it? Um, Manhattan. So let's have a look. It says here, hide that comment. Uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night. A star-spangled sky, that's a thing I would like to try to do. So wrote Van Gogh to his friend Emile Bernard in the spring of 1888. So a year earlier, he'd been thinking about trying to paint a star-spangled sky. For months afterward, the problem obsessed him until finally in June 1889, he painted The Starry Night. The Starry Night is not one of Van Gogh's most moving and beautiful pictures. And this is what they said at the time. That's in November 1941. It has also a particular interest, which is painted during a critical turning point in his art and in his life. I also don't think people are that um, aware of that today. And so this is what's quite interesting. It is often assumed that Starry Night was bought, but it was actually just an exchange. Starry Night was swapped by the dealer Paul Rosenberg for three paintings bequeathed by Lily Bliss, Cezanne's Portrait of Victor Choquet, um, Fruit and Wine, and Henry toulouse lautrecs May Balfour in Pink. In return, Rosenberg offered Starry Night, which he had bought from Stolk, and it became the first Van Gogh to be acquired by a New York museum. Quite interesting. So I think that's about three surprises. Now, number four, Van Gogh never actually called it Starry Night. I find that just so interesting how it's almost like comic books and other popular things. Um, society confers the right name for something. Um, it's, you know, it's a combination of what somebody does and then what is assumed was done. Anyway, so Vincent um, gave different descriptions of it. He called it Night Effect. Theo called it The Village in the Moonlight. You can imagine if if the painting was ultimately called The Village in the Moonlight, it, it would probably never have become as famous as it did. Um, because Starry Night is something that is just so um, characteristic of the human condition. It's something that we all have experienced, right? Um, just in a very um, classical way. That's something that is part of the human experience. I'm not saying a village in the moonlight isn't, just that a starry night is just something that we all have probably experienced. I know when I lived in South Korea, I was quite surprised that you'd look up and you could barely see a single star. Um, whereas in South Africa, it's very normal to see stars pretty much wherever you are. When you go up to the mountains and suddenly the stars double, and I'm sure if you go to the Himalayas, they then triple and quadruple. So anyway, it says here, um, after the artist's death, it was often known as the stars. Now, even that title isn't particularly evocative. The stars, right? Starry night, I don't know, just starry night says something, I think, also about, it's almost like the interplay between 
the person on the ground and the heavens and also the heavens looking down on the person on the ground you know it's 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 the link between um it's the link between the divine and the ordinary in a way And so how did it get the name Starry Night? Well, from Sterrenacht in Dutch. Uh, it was called, it was at an exhibition in Rotterdam in 1927 that the picture was given this title. And so, you know, it, it was exhibited in 1927. Only, how long did it take? Um, 13 years from that exhibition before it was, acquired in a swap in New York, right? It wasn't even bought, just acquired in a swap. So it, it really, you know, if you look at this um, announcement in the Bulletin of the Museum of Modern Art, November 1941, it, it basically took uh, almost 50 years for a major museum to recognize story night as something worth having they didn't think of it as the centerpiece they just thought it's probably an important um artwork Let, let's let's have one artwork from this artist vincent van gogh and you know it was the first van gogh acquired by a new york museum and i think that may also have something to do with how it became an iconic artwork you know if it didn't go to new york um, would it have acquired the fame and the stature that it ultimately did acquire? Um, so I think that's four. There's something else I wanted to mention. Uh, let's see if I can find it. What happened to that picture? Either it's been removed or maybe I've lost it. Okay, so let's let me take you through another thing. I don't know whether I agree with this. It says here that the swirling sky was inspired by Hokusai, does that look like, does that, does that look similar to that? I suppose that does look a little bit like a wave. Anyway, it says here, Vincent was a huge admirer of the great wave painted in about 1831. He wrote to his brother Theo a few months before he painted Starry Night that Hokusai's waves are claws. The boat is caught in them. You can feel it. Um, in Hokusai's print, the wave towers over the volcanic peak of Mount Fiji. So that's that's a mountain. Unless I didn't quite see that. And then... And then that's the wave. So he's, he's playing games with scale. And whereas Van Gogh's painting, the swirling mass in the sky hurtles towards the more gentle slopes of the less alpils. That's those are actually mountains I cycled over. They're not they're not as small as they may appear. These these mountains. And uh, does he mention the tree? To me, the um, this tree kind of is the bridge between heaven and earth in a way. Uh, the tree is truly enormous. I mean, it makes the church look tiny, like this tiny little needle in comparison. It basically almost reasserts the, um, the 
is it the dominance, the um, the imminence of nature, right? Eminence. Is it? Can you guys hear the hear that? Eminence. Yeah. So, position of prominence or superiority, um, the yeah, um, the eminence of nature. Okay, so um, there's something that I really wanted to show you guys, but I'm I, I may have lost it. It's a really incredible picture of um, Van Gogh's nephew, so his son's child, and wonder if this is it, and and Joe Van Gogh and all of them kind of in the same room. I actually thought I had it here. Um, just give me a second. I thought it was actually part of this article, so I'm a little bit surprised not to see it now. Unless it's kind of just been removed at the last minute. Anyway, let's see if I can uh, relocate it. Um, oh, good. So here it is. Okay, so that's from this um, article. It's uh, the article is titled "Joe Van Gogh Bonga, the woman who made Va um, Vincent Van Gogh." It's not that image; it's this one. Um, there, there is Theo. Uh, that's Andris Bonga. But the picture I want to show you is this one. That's Theo Van Gogh in Amsterdam. It shows you the Van Goghs weren't the most handsome men in the world. There is Joe Van Gogh with um, Theo's child.
But the picture I want to show you is it's actually not that one. It's this one. The picture I want to show you is this one. And remember the poll question is how many, um, not how many, when, when were ra radios uh, available or were radios around during Van Gogh's lifetime? And the answer is no. 45% of you got that right, uh, less than half of you. Um, so can you imagine... Can you imagine, and I mean, this is partly why I want to show you this picture, and this to me is kind of the biggest surprise um, in terms of Starry Night, is, is you kind of just get the idea of what it was like in this time before Van Gogh uh, became famous, before Starry Night became what it was. I mean, it wasn't even called Starry Night. But I want to kind of just take you into the world of this picture. So first of all, um, have, have you listened to the radio today? Did you get into your vehicle? Did you get into your vehicle and listen to the radio at all today? Uh, Stephanie, good to see you, right? And so if you just take that one thing, um, in 1890, radios didn't exist at all. I think they came around about six years later, 1896, something like that. So imagine living your whole life. If you just think of your lifestyle, when you drive somewhere, you know, I'm sure you listen to music and so on, but you probably also listen to the local radio st station. Maybe if you don't do that much now, maybe you did as a kid. But just think about that one thing, um, radio having an influence on so many other things, on music, on the news, on um, people being made aware of certain things. Now, imagine taking all of that completely out of your culture, completely out of you, the human experience, right? If you take um, radio completely out of the human experience, um, then it's not only a radio, it's also a um, music station in a in a vehicle uh, also you don't have a vehicle right so that's also gone there's no television either there's no internet there are no phones and um electricity is basically just kind of starting to happen so if you look at this image um can you see this looks like a, there's a lamp over here Right, that's something fairly new at that time. Um, street lamps w were something very new um, at that time. I'm just going to look at when did street lamps? So Paris actually got the world's first electric street lamps, um, and they were installed in 1878. And so, but in a little town like all um, other little towns, you, you might not necessarily have it rolled out there yet, right? But imagine something like that, that uh, at least for half of your life, um, you don't actually have electrified street lamps. That the lamps, the street lights are actually lit by somebody who goes up and climbs up a ladder and kind of lights the lamp, right? And uh, they use whale oil to, to fuel the lamps, which is why so many whale, partly why so many whales are um, are cold or um, you know hunted down almost to the point of extinction. But if you look at this um, this photo, you see some of Van Gogh's paintings, right? So there is the um, the bridge, and this is right outside all. This is 
Joe Bonga, and that is young young Vincent, not Vincent Van Gogh, but Theo's son Vincent. And you can see he's sort of um, dressed in a suit and tie. He's quite a young kid, but he's dressed in a suit and tie. Uh, does he look terribly happy? It kind of looks like they very um, caught up in um, what's the word? The, the strictures of society. You must present yourself a certain way. Um, you've got to worry about what other people think to some extent. Anyway, so there is that that picture. I think it's the Langloy Bridge. Let's see if I can find a color version of that. some point we actually need to get cracking with the with the Van Gogh letters, but it's basically this picture. Right? Look at that picture there. And then look at this one. Right? It's basically the same. Right? So if you could just add color then that's that's kind of what you would see. I must say something seems to be missing there. So it might not be exactly that picture. Is there another one? Let's have a look. Anyway, I think that's close enough. That's close enough, right? And so it's not a bad picture. Um, quite muted tones, though. And then if you look at the top of the screen, uh, this picture over here, um, I think is this one, the wheat field outside all anyway it's certainly near all just trying to see if i can get a better version than that it's not this picture although that's not far from where it was painted um, so that is another um picture of joe when she's a little bit older and you can see she's by her writing desk. And once again, she's surrounded by paintings of um, Van Gogh's paintings. So there's a flower study, and, and there is um, someone, a painting I, I don't really recognize. Uh, I think it's from all, but I can't say I really know where it is. But this is basically where you can imagine she got to work, um, you know, writing and publishing his his things. And you, you can kind of get an idea, it was quite hard, dreary work that took a lot of time and you didn't really have that much to show for it. Little Vincent grew up to become an engineer and so on and so on. So anyway, this is the picture that I just find very evocative because it gives you a, a real sense of what it was like to be alive at that time, doesn't it? So in this picture are uh, Joe with her second husband, Johan Goschalk. 
and one one wonders you know if she'd married someone else maybe maybe her husband also helped facilitate you can see he's got his hand on a on a piece of paper there um you know if she'd married a guy who hated uh, art or um, hated writing or you know maybe he was a sportsman or something um, would the Van Gogh letters have reached us would Van Gogh have become who he ultimately became you don't really hear much about him do you so although um, Joe Van Gogh gets a lot of recognition and I think recognition that's due um, one's also got to wonder about her second husband. There's just a little bit of information about him. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, he is, was Dutch, first of all. If he, had, if he had been French, would that have made a difference, do you think? He's a Dutch jurist, right? Someone who's an expert in the law. Uh, he's a graphic artist, right? And a painter is also a painter of Jewish ancestry. His sister was also a well-known painter. So what I'm trying to say is if she'd married someone who wasn't interested in painting, then would he have been sympathetic to her trying to establish this guy's legacy? And would he have provided resources and support and all that kind of thing? Right? Anyway, a little bit more. Um, his father, Salomon, was a dealer in dairy products. He originally studied law. He took private painting lessons from Jan Veth in Busum. He received permission by royal decree to add his mother's maiden name to his own. Most of his works were portraits or landscapes. In 1901, so um, about, about 10 years after Theo's death, he married Joanna Bonga. Um, they built a villa named Akenoff, and then they moved to Amsterdam. In 1905, he helped to organize, see, so, so he did play a role. He, he helped to organize an exhibition of the works of Vince Van Gogh at the Steerdlake Museum. He also wrote the introduction for the catalog. After that, he continued his efforts to make Van Gogh's work more widely known. He was also in poor health. His condition worsened after 1910. He spent much of his time bedridden or in a sanatorium. When he died, Johanna held a retrospective exhibition of his work. So her husband's work, her second husband's work. Later, she resumed calling herself Van Gogh Bonga. So it's quite interesting that after he died, she didn't refer to herself as... Um, Johann Goschalk, right? It's quite interesting. Anyway, there's a little bit of backstory that you guys may or may not have been aware of. And I think now it's time that we commence with uh, Van Gogh letters. What do you guys say? Uh, incidentally, if you want to read another article on the woman who made Van Gogh, then you can read this one. Um, it's from the New York Times Magazine, so you guys can check it out. Okay, are you guys ready to get rolling? Yeah, definitely a supportive husband. Um, you know, and also not just supportive, he was also someone who was interested in art himself, which I think is a factor. Okay, let's get going. So, in, I think we've actually touched on this letter, but towards the end of January, Vincent writes a letter to Paul Gauguin. And as, you, as many of you guys know, I believe Gauguin actually is the person who, who, who sliced off Van Gogh's ear. And so is there any evidence of that in this letter? Is there any evidence of the ear murder weapon and also of any animus between the two? Let's have a look. 
my dear friend Gorgan, thanks for your letter. Left behind alone on board my little yellow house. He's, um, do you think he's very happy about that? That's how he basically says, you abandoned me. You betrayed me. As it was perhaps my duty anyway to be the last to leave, I'm not a little put out at my friend's departure. And so in a little bit of a cryptic way, he's saying, I'm not very happy with you. Rulong got his transfers to Marseille and has just left. It has been touching to see him these last few days with little Marcel, making her laugh and dandling her on his knee. Now, you also notice that the length of this letter is not very long. That's the letter. Now, you might say, well, no, to me, that seems like a very long letter. But then how well do you know Van Gogh? Because this is the letter he wrote his brother. Now, just to, if you unsure of what I'm saying, Look at the length of this little gray bar here. Can you see the cursor here? The cursor is now over the painting at the bottom right. Now it's coming over to me. And now it's going to the peach. And now just right of the peach, it's on that, that bar, right? Now look at the size of that bar for 19th of January. And then the, the length of the um, margin under it, and then look at the bar, just take note, is this the same size as the next letters bar? And there you can see, it seems like it's not a lot, but it actually is quite a lot more, right? This is a much longer letter and this is a much, much, much longer letter, especially this letter, than certainly this letter. And I think that is relevant. Anyway, he says his transfer means he's being separated from his family. And you will not be surprised that the man whom you and I uh, one evening nicknamed the passerby was very heavy hearted. And so was I on witnessing that and other upsetting things. So, you know, um, Van Gogh could write about anything. You know, he can really choose whatever he wants to talk about. And so what does he say? I'm, 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 I'm very put out by your departure. I mean, by saying I'm not a little put out. It's another way of saying I am a lot put out. I'm very put out by your departure. What's another way of saying put out? I mean, we, we don't tend to use that expression. Um, you know, it's another way of saying inconvenienced. W what is uh, another word for put out? Right, and so if you go to that, it says, if you feel put out, you feel annoyed or upset. And Gauguin maybe would have felt, I, I didn't blame him for feeling annoyed or upset. And so that is how he feels. I'm not a little annoyed, I'm very annoyed. I'm not a little upset, I'm very upset. Then he talks about something else. And then he says, um, he talks about being very heavy hearted. He could talk about anything. He's talking about someone else being very heavy hearted. Well, he probably feels the same way. He also refers to, and so was I on witnessing that and other upsetting things. Maybe a bit of a cryptic remark. When he sang to his child, his voice took on a strange timber in which one could hear the voice of a woman rocking a cradle or of a sorrowing wet nurse and then another trumpet sound like a clarion call to France. I reproach myself now that it was I, perhaps insisting too much that you stay on here to await events. I reproach myself now that perhaps it was I who was the cause of your departure. Unless, of course, that departure was planned beforehand. Now, if you think about what he's saying here, he basically uh, touches on I'm upset with you, then kind of goes away from the subject matter and then returns to it. 
and then he says i'm i regret um you know it's not really the kind of language we would use um you know reproach he feels a sense of disapproval but directed not only towards gorgan but to himself disapproval disappointment um it's within the uh, context of uh, admonishment admonition scolding castigation um, remonstrating reprimanding criticism censure telling off roasting well earful <laughs> um slap on the wrist rap on the knuckles it's the opposite of praise right is feeling that he um that in a way it's his own fault for saying you know what you need to stay here and you can imagine that that was the argument that led to the ear incident was that van gogh said to him that they drank a lot and perhaps in an uninhibited state um gauguin said you know what your brother's uh, getting married and you know it, it reminds me there's someone that i love that's that's that way i want to go and see her bernard's sister and um you know this this place doesn't really suit me and then when van gogh kind of reacted to that that's when there was a reaction from um gauguin and it reminds me a little bit of the oscar pistorius case sorry to jump into you know the subject matter of another channel but you know in oscar pistorius case i believe something happened on oscar's phone reva reacted and then oscar reacted to that reaction you know we tend to think of it like in a very one or two dimensional way that something happened and then there's a reaction but you could also have it in a three-dimensional way where in a three-stage way where as i say in this case um gauguin feels like he wants to do something he's reacting to theo getting engaged um it's the end of the year it's christmas he's is with this weirdo and he wants to kind of be with his own people he wants to live life on his own terms and then van gogh reacts and then he reacts to van gogh reacting and it's possibly under the influence of absent or whatever does that make sense and so he says you know i reproach myself um for insisting too much that you stay on here now when he says insisting too much it might sound like that he just said many times please don't leave you know like please don't leave please don't, but probably what he means by insisting too much is insisting too emotionally insisting too dramatically insisting too annoyingly you know kind of thing and then he also kind of puts gorgan on a bit of a guilt trip he says was that departure planned beforehand and you always thought like when you when you left um france sorry when you left um i think it was Brittany, and you always planned just to be at the yellow house for like two months or three months um and so there's a, he has a little bit of van gogh basically accusing his friend and suggesting that his friend's motives weren't weren't very good does that make sense then he says and that it was therefore perhaps up to me to show i still had the right to be kept fully in the picture now i must say i think that that is absolutely fair i mean what do you guys think Did, didn't he have the right to be kept fully in the picture he had made the house habitable he had prepared the house he invited gorgan he decorated the house he bought the furniture he put he invested a heck of a lot in the whole thing and so it feels like he feels like gorgan had lied to him or misled him or somehow misrepresented things 
right? He's basically saying, and Van Gogh's not the kind of guy to do this very often. You very seldom get the sort of language from him, but he basically says, you know what, you should have been honest with me. You know, if you were going to do this, you should have told me beforehand. And you kind of get the idea it was sprung on him. Anyway, he says, be that as it may, I hope we still like each other enough to be able to start afresh. So he's basically saying, you know what, you were a jerk. You were, you know, and I blame myself for being so naive or whatever. But he basically says, you're an arsehole but I hope we can still get along. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if the art experts focus on this and also on that, where they say, I reproached myself. Well, I cut my ear because I reproached myself. Or I reproached myself and so I cut off my ear. No, I don't think so. Then he says, um, I hope we still like each other enough to start afresh, assuming that the wolf at the door should necessitate such a measure it's quite it's quite interesting language the wolf at the door who is the wolf at the door he says you mention a canvas of mine in your letter sunflowers on a yellow background and make it plain you'd rather like to have it now you may remember in our previous van gogh letters episode uh, 72, uh, didn't we touch on the fact that he was saying um, it, it seemed like a situation where Gauguin was blackmailing, where Black Gauguin had taken paintings that didn't belong to him, right? Gauguin took Van Gogh's paintings, paintings that didn't belong to Gauguin, that paintings that Gauguin had no right to take right? And now he's got them, and he's basically saying, um, I'd, I'd actually like to keep them, right? I'd like to keep them. And you can imagine, you know, if, if Gauguin doesn't feel like Van Gogh's being um, pliable, amenable, cooperating, then he can basically hold that over his head and say, you know, if you don't play ball with this, you're not going to get what you want in this situation. And so, but he says, I don't think it's a bad choice. But then he says, surely I can lay claim to the sunflower. And then he says, I think I'll begin by returning what is yours. So I don't know, don't you get the impression he wants the sunflowers back? He's, he's already mentioned it to Theo, like, See, I don't know why I took the sunflowers. Why does he have my sunflowers? Let's go back to that briefly. He says, see if I can find it quite quickly. I forgot to mention that I had a letter from Gauguin about the masks and fencing gloves. And then he says, um, Maybe it's a previous painting. Seventeen. Let's just see if it's somewhere in here. Don't see it. So Yari says. For the moment, I'm keeping my canvases here, and I, I'm definitely keeping my sunflowers in question. He has two of them already, right? But you, you kind of get the sense that he didn't really want him to have them. He says, I think it's strange that he claims a picture of sunflowers from me. Right? Can you see that he's not happy about that? I don't think you'd say... I'm, I'm really complimented, I'm really pleased that he's got a picture of sunflowers from me. He's saying, um, I mean, just saying it's rather strange is, is kind of a nicer of saying that's a bit fucked up. It's a bit fucked up what he did. You know, he left me and he took one of my favorite paintings that didn't belong to him. Now he's addressing him directly. 
and he's saying, you mentioned a canvas of mine. He says, um, it's a not a bad choice. And you make it plain that you'd like to have it. And he says, I, above all others, can, can lay claim to the sunflower. Then he says, I think I'll begin by returning what is yours. And that's a reference to his fencing equipment. Let me be clear what we're talking about here. He doesn't even mention it directly, but he's saying, I'm going to give you your fucking swords back. You know, the, the sword that very likely chopped off my ear, and I, I showed you a picture earlier. Let's see if we can find it. You know, if you think of a, um, let me make it a little bit bigger. If you think of a sword slicing off an ear, wouldn't it more than likely leave that little piece at the bottom? Compared to if someone used something like a razor, this would be the very the hardest part because it's cartilage and there's an artery there. This would be the hardest part to sever. And this would be the easiest part to sever. And it would also be a bit of a jagged thing because you using a razor, you would do it in kind of stages, right? And so you would imagine, if you look at the, um, the drawing, can you see it's a, a straight line going down like that? It's a straight line. And I, I would imagine if one used your own hand, it would be more of a jagged line, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Anyway, so he says, while observing that it is my intention after, after what has happened, what do you think that's a reference to? Categorically to deny your right to the canvas in question. And there you have it. I've, I've tried to make the case that that's how he feels before he's made it himself. There he said, I think it's strange that he claims a picture of sunflowers from me. He doesn't want him to have those sunflowers. And so hasn't Gauguin taken the painting to kind of, in the aftermath, have a bit of um, blackmailing power? He knows it means a lot to Vincent. But he says, but since I commend your intelligence in choosing this canvas, do you think he is being a little bit sarcastic there? That is a really clever move of you to take that canvas, because you know how much it means to me. And so as a result, I'll make the effort to paint Two of them exactly alike, okay? In which case it can all be done and settled amicably so that you can have your own in the end all the same. You kind of get the sense that he's feeling really um, uh, kind of done in. Then he says, I made a fresh start today on my canvas of Mademoiselle Roulon and the one in which, due to my accident, the hands had been left unfinished. That's what he calls it my accident as an arrangement of colors the reds moving through to pure orange building up again in the flesh tones to the chromes passing through the pinks and blending with the olive and malachite greens as an impressionist arrangement of colors i've never devised anything better now i must say him saying due to my accident that does sound a bit like i accidentally cut off my ear I mean, if Gauguin cut off his ear, why would he call it my accident? Except that he does blame himself up here. He says, I reproach myself. And then he says it again. I reproach myself. Right? And in that sense, he's saying it's my fault it's my accident anyway he says as an arrangement of colors blah 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 pinks blending um i've never devised anything better so he's basically very happy with this picture so he's directing um gorgan's attention to this picture and if you think about it isn't that gauguin's chair and isn't she sitting in the chair with like a rosary 
at her hands, almost as if he's saying to Gauguin cryptically through the letter, something about, I forgive you, maybe you can forgive me, something like that. It's quite interesting how everything is green here. And they also seem to be flowers. I don't know if they're sunflowers, but flowers coming out. But I mean, look at this picture and look at Gauguin's chair. Isn't it the same chair? Look at the um, look at the edge over here, like this part over here. Now, must I don't see the back part of it, but certainly look at that part and the that part over there and and this. Is it the same? What do you think? Could it be the same? What I'm trying to say is, you know, is he cryptically basically saying, so, well, I really like this picture. And then if Gauguin looks at it, he sees someone sitting in his chair and she's holding, um, I mean, what, what, what does she have in her hands there? Isn't that a symbol of um, peace or forgiveness? Isn't that a rosary or something? And he says, and I'm sure that if one were to put this canvas just as it is in a fishing boat, even one from Iceland, there would be some among the fishermen who would feel they were there inside the cradle. Oh, my dear friend, to achieve in painting with the music of Berlioz and Wagner has already done, an art that offers consolation for the brokenhearted. There are still just a few who feel, who feel it as you and I do, and Look at all of these exclamation marks. And so I guess he's offering this painting in a way, not so much, he's not saying, yeah, take this painting, but he's offering the, the um, what is presented in the painting as a kind of a consolation to Gauguin, isn't she, isn't he? Basically, a woman sitting, I think, possibly in his chair and appearing to be um, dignified and um, at peace with the world. And what does she say? What does he say? Uh, um, anyway. He's basically in that picture he sees consolation for the brokenhearted and i think he is brokenhearted and maybe he thinks in a lovesick way gorgan is brokenhearted and i think story night is also meant in that kind of respect that story night is kind of meant as consolation for the brokenhearted because you know, he was brokenhearted in the asylum. And although he's painting the disturbia of his own um, mindset, I think he's also painting something of the solace of the night, something of the, the spectacular uh, fireworks of the night sky that is in a way soothing to the little village beneath it. You know, that puts into perspective the troubles of the little people in the in that little village, right? Then he says, my brother understands you well. And when he tells me that you are a poor sort of wretch like me, well, that just proves that he understands us. That's another cryptic remark. Uh, you know what? You are a poor sort of wretch. I shall send you your things, but I still have bouts of weakness at times during which I'm in no position to even lift a finger to return your things to you. 
In a few days' time, I'll pluck up the courage, and as for the fencing masks and gloves, make as little use of, as possible of less infantile engines of war. These terrible engines of war will have to wait until then. Now, like I'm, I'm trying to been, try, been trying to suggest throughout this um, letter, he seems to be making quite a lot of cryptic remarks. He seems to be saying things without saying them, right? He seems to be, um, it, it's very cryptic. You know, I'm, instead of saying, I'm annoyed at your departure, he says, I'm not a little put out at my friend's departure. You know, referring to him as my friend instead of your is also just a, another little subtlety. It also seems as though he's not asking for the sunflowers back. I mean, what does he say here? Um, I want to categorically deny your right to the canvas in question, but then I think he doesn't. He says, since I commend your intelligence, I'll make the effort to paint two of them exactly alike. So he's actually talking about settling things amicably. And why is he doing that? Because things aren't amicable between the two of them. And I think this says so much. He says, bouts of weakness, um, lift a finger, talks about plucking up the courage, all in the, in the context of fencing, fencing masks and gloves, engines of war, terrible engines of war. Isn't this the engine of war that, that plucked off his ear, that, that, that are responsible for his bouts of weakness? I'm writing to you very calmly, but packing up what's left is still beyond me. So, you know, he's still feeling, although he sounds quite strong throughout this whole letter, right? He says, you know, um, I reproach myself, etc. There's There is a sense of weakness in this letter. <clears throat> I've been left behind alone. Um, he talks about upsetting things. He talks about uh, the sorrowing. Um, he talks about feelings of reproach. Wolf at the door. And then and then he paints something that offers consolation for the brokenhearted. He's definitely feeling brokenhearted. He mentions that to Gauguin. Anyway, he says, in my mental or nervous fever or madness, I'm not too sure how to put it or what to call it, my thoughts sailed over many seas. And again, this is what art experts seize on. While they're saying... To Gauguin, I'm mad. Oh, that must mean he is mad. Would, did, would he use that turn of phrase with his own brother? Anyway, let's go on to the short letter to A. Kuerling. Let's just have a look at some of your comments. Yeah, he does seem quite vulnerable. Um, if you guys want to follow along, here's a link to the letter. Sorry, I normally put it up a bit sooner than that. Yeah, it does seem that way. Okay, so my friend Kuenang, he says, thanks for having wished me a happy new year all the way from the north of our native country. I received your postcard in the hospital at all. And so what's interesting about this letter is he gives a version of events to a third party, not to Gauguin and not to Theo, 
to someone and, and, and what does he say to this third party? Well, he says, I had an attack of something, the matter with my brains or otherwise a fever. But notice the word attack. I had an attack of something. I've been caught following an attack. So, you know, you can either say that he was attacked by madness or you could say that he felt that something or someone attacked him. But that's the word that he uses, attack, right? And and he says, you know, it was as a result of something to do with my fever or my brains. Um, again, a little bit cryptic, but it's interesting his turn of phrase. And as for the causes and consequences of said illness, I, I shall be wise to leave the solving of these problems to the casual discussions of the Dutch catechists. So it's quite cryptic again that, you know, he doesn't just say what happened. Like, nowhere does he say, um, and I think this is really important to point out, um, nowhere does he seem to say, I was, you know, I was really in distress and so I did this to myself. And neither does he say, we had a huge argument and he did this to me. He doesn't make either of those claims. He basically says, I'm going to leave the solving of this to, to someone else. They can say whether I'm mad or not, or whether I have been mad and I'm still mad in some imagination of a purely sculptural nature. And so he's aware that people are going to be gossiping about him being mad. Does he sound mad? I mean, does he sound mad in any of the letters prior to or afterwards? I mean, even in his letter to Gauguin, he seems pretty reasonable in how he's discussing dealing with things. I don't know, like, I find it quite weird how he's known as the mad artist, and yet he makes his own ironic self-references to madness. After having thus given you ample information with regard to the state of my mind and body, I suppose you will think it less miraculous that I did not answer you earlier. Meanwhile, we must not forget to stick to the point. And starting from here, starting from there, I ask you what you are doing in the art of painting and how you are working with the colors. As far as I know, I've seen absolutely none of your studies, which you sent to Theo, in spite of my urgent request to you for one of your works. Does the fault lie with Theo? Now, I just want to take you back to this, this painting. Um, part of, I think, the, the, the restless maelstrom of those stars is this place that he finds himself in where people are gossiping about him. There's this sort of restless atmosphere above his fate. Um, you know, is he mad? Is he sick? Is he, you know, and, and so things are in like a state of, um, of of fluctuation. And so it's no wonder he paints this, given that he's, he's not really doing anything to come to me. Come, come up. He's not really doing anything to do rumor control. I mean, how hard could it be just to say, Gauguin did it? Or... Um, I did this to myself. Why is it such a mystery? And I think it makes more sense for it to be a mystery if Gauguin did it and Gauguin has a business relationship with his brother and his brother is struggling a little bit uh, in the art business and Gauguin at that stage, was his art was selling. So it's kind of a sensitive thing, isn't it? Anyway. Do you, do you see how important the context is? I mean, the the point of these uh, Van Gogh letters is to understand the run-up to Starry Night, like what was the context to Starry Night. And although we're going to get bogged down in, in individual letters and individual thoughts, we must remember what the woods are what was generally said in January, what is generally said in February, what is generally said in March, and then in April, shortly after he enters the asylum, he paints this picture. And, 
you know, the other thing that I think you've got to acknowledge is um, at this point, he doesn't think he's mad. At this point, he doesn't think he, he's like ready to continue producing art and continuing where he left off, right? And you, you kind of sense that when he enters the asylum, and did you know this, he admitted himself. It's not like someone said, I diagnose you as mad and you are now under armed guard, you're going to the asylum. He basically admitted himself to the asylum, but basically because he he'd lost his home. He'd lost his... Um, um, what do you call it? Uh, it lost the um, the the thing that he had been setting up. It, it sort of lost it, and so going to the asylum was like picking up the pieces. But you can imagine the first nights in the asylum, especially having um, admitted himself into it, had to have felt devastating. That he that in a way he was forced to throw the towel in on his own adventure, and so it would almost it would almost be like um, if you imagine Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, you can almost imagine Brian Laundry um, cutting off Gabby's pinky, right, and then abandoning her. And then she tries to continue the van life journey and then she eventually just gives up and goes to um, goes to like a um, yoga retreat and but then ends up spending a year there just trying to pick up the pieces. It, it would be that kind of feeling of absolute devastation. Somebody betrayed you, but you've also reached the point where you've just run out of resources to keep your own adventure going you know that would be extremely devastating and 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 it's again within that context that he paints starry night you know it's almost that the 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 universe is all powerful and this little town beneath is at its mercy you know that, that the the sky above is monstrous and um and and powerful and the um, little town is absolutely helpless and at its mercy. I mean, that's another way to interpret Starry Night. It's not this sweet little portrait of, of you know, the sweet, cute portrait. It actually captures the vicissitudes of of real life, right? As, as um, fairy tale and fictitious and sweet as it appears, it's actually um, a painting about the reality of the human condition. And you might say it's magical, maybe it is, you might say it's dark, you might say it's disturbing, you might say it's chaotic, you might say it's um, roiling with imagination I, I think to some extent you what you see is is your own psychology but the, the question is are you seeing what van gogh was thinking and i don't think he was thinking peaceful thoughts when he painted it he seems to be recognizing the violence of the human condition and again just remember that there's no radio there's no television there's no internet, there's no phone. Um, and so it's a very silent world. And in that silence can be the noise of your own mind. Okay. Anyway, so back to this letter, he says, um, did you know that Theo is engaged and is going to marry an Amsterdam girl within a relatively short time? After this question on your work, a few words about mine. At present, I have in mind, or rather at my easel, the portrait of a woman, right? And it's that one. I call it La Bercuse, or as we say in Dutch, after Van Eerden, you know who wrote that particular book I gave you to read? 
or in Van Eerden's Dutch, quite simply, our lullaby or the woman rocking the cradle. It is a woman in a green dress. The hair is quite orange and in plates. The complexion is chrome yellow. The hands holding the rope of the cradle, the same. That's what she's holding. At the bottom, the background is vermilion. The wall is covered with wallpaper, which, of course, I've calculated in conformity with the rest of the colors. This wallpaper is bluish green with pink dahlias and spotted with orange and ultramarine. In this, I think I've run pretty well parallel with Van Eden and his style of writing. Whether I really sang a lullaby in colors is something I leave to the critics, particularly to the aforesaid ones. So that's what he's saying. You know, a, he sang a lullaby in colors. In a way, he's trying to soothe himself with this painting of a a mother. You know, he's trying. He's just lost his ear. He's lost his friend, and in a way, he's trying to soothe himself with this lullaby and he's saying it's a lullaby of color um maybe it is i'm not sure if i i, I don't really get it if, if that is what it what it's supposed to do i don't really feel soothed i don't feel it's a particularly fantastic artwork but maybe he did then he says um we talked all this over sufficiently at the time I mean, the eternal problem of colors, which leads us on as far as our tranquility of mind will allow. So there is talking about the tranquility of mind. This painting is about the tranquility of the mind, or at least lack of. And, you know, it's different to say if your mind's not tranquil. That doesn't mean you're mad. You know, there's, there are a lot of... Um, shades of gray you know if your mind isn't tranquil not tranquility madness there can be um tranquility and you at peace but then there can also be unsettled you can be disturbed you can be troubled you can be depressed you can be in despair there's this whole spectrum between tranquility and and madness <clears throat> And it's not to say that you don't move across that spectrum um, from tranquility to madness and then also back from madness somewhat back to tranquility. If you think of this picture, isn't it a combination of tranquility at the bottom there and madness at the top? Tranquility, madness. Mad, uh, tranquility, madness. At any rate, on leaving the hospital, I made a portrait of my own doctor. He says, I haven't lost my equilibrium as a painter. So, I don't, in his own words, he's saying, I, I still have mental equilibrium. You know, and the other thing is, are you telling me a mad guy could paint with that kind of perception? And at the same time, he's also saying, he's giving himself the, the benefit. He's saying that, I mean, what, what did he say to Gauguin? Um, let's just go back to that quickly. Just where he um, sings his own praises for a moment, he basically says, um, he, he calls it um, to achieve in painting what the music of Berlioz and Wagner has already done an art that offers consolation uh, what does he say here you know, I'm sure that if one were to put this canvas in a fishing boat you'd feel like you were inside the cradle. Um, so I don't know, you know, you kind of get the sense that he really feels like he's achieved something with this painting. He says, 
Yeah, I have never devised anything better. I mean, I don't know if I agree with that, but he certainly doesn't feel that losing an ear has made him any worse as a painter, does it? And to Kuanang, he basically says, um, what does he say about the color? Um, He, he, he believes that he sang a lullaby in colors in that particular painting, which is another way of him saying, I, I think I did a pretty good job here. So you, you certainly don't have a sense of him so overcome with his own disturbia that he can't paint. And of course, if he'd cut off his own ear in a fit of whatever, you, you would imagine that that disturbia wouldn't have just disappeared. Then he says, from that time onward, I've painted quite a considerable number of studies. Among other things, last summer, two flower pieces with nothing but sunflowers in a yellow earthen pot. That's that one. And that is one of the paintings that is most famous for Van Gogh's sunflowers. Painted with three chrome yellows, yellow ochre and malachite green and nothing else. I'm not a huge fan of it, but there it is. For the time being, I'm staying on in all. Well, he's right about that. Um, he doesn't know how long he's going to be there, but uh, there it is. He's going to see how things go. Um, by the way, his fate in all is very much hanging in the air. The people around him are feeling disquieted by his presence. And anyway, he says, and keeping myself at your disposal in the matter of correspondence. Not long ago, Theo went to see Breitner and discussing his work, he told me that after all he considered Breitner the best painter and thinker over there. Goodbye, Amis, with a handshake in thought. The address is still plus Lamartine to all. Now, by the way, if you had to put that address into Google Maps, it doesn't exist anymore because it was bombed during the Second World War. So that yellow house is not there. Uh, it just doesn't exist anymore. Okay, when are we going to get out of January? There are not a lot of letters in February. And then after that, we're almost in March. And then it's the asylum. So we don't want to get out of January too quickly. Okay, next letter. My dear Theo, thank you for your letter and the 50 franc note it contained. Of course, I'm now safe until the arrival of your letter after the first. What happened about that money was entirely pure chance and misunderstanding for which neither you nor I are responsible. I don't know whether he's referring to the air incident when he says pure chance and misunderstanding. But anyway, he says, by just the same mischance, I could not telegraph, as you said, because I did not know if he was still in Amsterdam or back in Paris. I think Theo may have said, you could always have um, telegraphed me, don't come or something. It is over now with the rest and is one more proof of the proverb that misfortunes never come singly. And that's how he sees it as misfortune. Rule, that's quite a... Um, tranquil way of like if you um if you cut off your own ear would you tell a relative that that you went through a period of misfortune i mean that's that's the height of a euphemism uh if someone else cut off your ear would you say yeah i went through a little bit of a misfortune most people would be a bit more emotional and um you'd point You'd want to blame something or someone for what happened, wouldn't you? Then his other friend, Roulard, left yesterday. He says it was touching to see him with his children this last day, especially with a quite tiny one. 
when he made her laugh and jump on his knee and sang for her. So, you know, how does Van Gogh feel about Rula having kids? Does he want to cut off his other ear because Rula might not spend so much time with him? Don't be stupid. So it's the same argument that he have, you know, was he this primitive person that if he found out that his brother was going to get married, he, he couldn't he couldn't handle life. This is a really resilient human being. This is a really strong person in a, in a, in a sense, stronger than most of us. So to, to re reduce him to this mad guy who, if he finds out his brother's going to have a child, just can't take the, the, it's devastating news that he can't live with. I mean, please, it just shows you don't know anything about this person. He says he's, and he said this before, his voice is a strangely pure and touching quality in which there was for my ear at once a sweet and mournful cradle song. I'm glad he said for my ear, not for my ears, because he's only got one. I sometimes say, people say, well, you've got a really good eye, you know, for photography. Then I say, I've actually got two. Anyway, uh, he was not sad, however. On the contrary, I had put on his brand new uniform, which he had received that very day, and everyone was making much of him. I've just finished a new canvas, which almost has what one might call a certain chic about it. Again, um, you know, he seems pretty back on board with his own art. He's, he's pretty confident in his own work. Not the kind of, you know, you can imagine if someone has a, had, had a mental health setback, that they would be having difficulty with their work. And I can tell you, um, I had a strong, you know, I think I worked quite hard in December, I worked quite hard in January. I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very troubled by the COVID insurance, the way that they've been treating me and just how hard it is to, you know, um, you know, when you're trying to fight for justice in your own area and um, like just having conversations is, is so difficult. People don't return your calls. And, the, you know, there's like a turnaround time of three weeks where they say, okay, we'll, we'll give them three weeks to reply. I, I just find the whole thing very, um, very strategic and and um, basically wicked. And I find it quite um, depressing. And that it does actually affect my ability to work. Um, just the fact that, um, you know, it's a simple thing and yet how they make it complicated and um, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, but what I'm trying to, say here is if you are feeling um, internal despair, it'll affect your work, right? And his work is not affected. He's by his own, um, on his own assessment, he's saying he feels chic about his work. There's, there's, a, there's a, a lullaby in how the colors mix. Um, you know, he says to Gauguin, I think this might be my finest work or something. He's certainly not struggling with his confidence, which you would imagine if he'd cut off his own ear, he was, he would be. Then he says, look, yeah, you, you do know that what I'm trying to do is get back the money that my training as a painter has cost, neither more nor less. I have a right to do that and to the earning of my daily bread. Again, does that sound like an unsound mind? I think it just that there should be that return. I don't say into your hands since we have done, since what we have done, we have done together. And to talk of money distresses us so much. So to come back to my insurance thing, you know, they'd actually agreed to give me probably 80%, 85% of what I'd asked for. And just I'm that kind of person, 
just like, well, you know what? The reality is I was actually in isolation for another two days and I also missed a flight. And, um, you know, let's, let's get real about what we're dealing with here. And then they found some little technicality to argue about. And I just found that whole thing, I find it personally um, not just opportunistic, but dishonest. Um, anyway. So I'll be very happy when it's dealt with so that I can stop um, letting it get me down. Because one way that it gets me down is I want it, I want it, to, I want it sorted out, right? Even if it goes, even, even, even if it goes against me, I would like it sorted out. But the, the whole thing of where you postpone and you delay and so on just makes one feel very weary. And, and I think that's part of their strategy is that they want most people just to um, um, throw it over their shoulder. You know, that's, that's probably works for them. And I have, I have actually thought of it. I've actually thought, you know, um, the money that you set to get from the insurer and the money that you can make working on a day-to-day -day basis, is it really worth um, is it really worth it? And then I think of how much time I spent sourcing documents, emailing people, phoning people, um, getting them the documents. And I probably have gone through sending them the documents three or four times now. So imagine a stack of documents this thick and imagine getting all of them, sending them, and then doing it another two times. So the one time was where I sent it to the wrong insurer. It was, I think it was called European Assist, but it was in America. And I, I needed to go to, I think, Europe Assist in South Africa. So all that work had to be kind of redone. And then after it was done, someone else gets onto it. Then you've got to do it again. Then you send it to the ombudsman. You've got to type out a summary. And I mean, all of that ends up being an enormous waste of time. Um, you should only have to send the documents one time and have one explanation and that's it. And why, why should it take more than a day or a week? Why, I mean, we are now heading to, when is it? It's um, November, December, January. We, we're now heading to four months, four months. So really, really annoying anyway. But what I'm trying to say is you can be down on something and then it affects your work. You know, if your mood is affected, your motivation is affected, and then your output is affected. Van Gogh's output doesn't seem to be affected. And and so the, the same argument I make here, I mean, it's not like he's painting pictures of um, uh, people in, in the arena or fist fights or something like that, you know, is painting paintings of consolation and colors in harmony. And he's talking about um, a postman who's um, in a nice way taking leave of his family, including a newborn child. That's where his mind is, right? Um, I can't say that my mind is on similarly... Um, peaceful subject matter, really, uh, definitely isn't. And uh, you may have noticed in the thing I posted about Harmony Montgomery, like a little bit of a bite in that thing. You know, it's like there's a little bit of extra sting in that statement, which wouldn't be there if, if you weren't also going through some kind of nastiness at your own expense, you know. Anyways, I'm, I'm just sharing that with you so that you can see that, you know, also in the period where Van Gogh was supposed to have taken his own life, he, um, his output is extremely high, arguably the highest in his entire life. So that tends to not um, correspond or correlate to... Um, feelings of despair, you know, when you are really, um, uh, certainly in an artistic sense, 
productive and prolific. You know, productive and prolific kind of go hand in hand with being motivated and passionate and having a sense of purpose and uh, being on track, not being off track and, you know, upset about something and overwhelmed by something, right? Anyway, he says, but let it go to your wife's hands who will join with us besides in working with the artist. If I'm not yet devoting much thought to direct sales, it is because my count of pictures is not yet complete, but it is getting on and I have set to work again with a nerve like iron. There again is a self-assessment. You know, it's not even the end of January. It's not even, it's one day less than a month after the incident. The incident happened on the 23rd of December. It's barely a month later and he's already saying, I'm, um, I've got the nerve of iron. I've got like an iron will, right? Where was I? I've set to work again with nerve like iron. And of course, that's what he means to do. Obviously, he's not able to keep it up. Uh, the, everything is falling apart around him. He says, I have good and ill luck in my production, but not ill luck only. For instance, if our Monticelli bunch of flowers is worth 500 francs to a collector, and it is, then I dare swear to you that my sunflowers are worth 500 francs too to one of these Scots or Americans. So he does feel quite strongly that the sunflowers are worth quite a bit of money. Well, he's got no idea they would one day be worth a fortune. But it does seem he's quite happy with the sunflowers where he's not, not that happy with the starry night. That reminds me, I, I want to just share some of my thoughts of starry night. One thing that shocked me with starry night, like, not just surprised me, shocked me, was that there were little areas where you could see the canvas through the through the the paint. I really didn't expect that. I really didn't think that, um, like, you know, Van Gogh's art is extremely is is um, when he paints. I think they call it um, uh, what's it? Is it antipasto? What's the word for thick paint? Impasto. Yeah. I mean, I'm almost describing a type of pasta. So impasto is a technique used in painting where paint is laid on an area of the surface thickly, usually thick enough that the brush or painting knife strokes are visible. Right, that's impasto. Right, and Van Gogh is the quintessential impasto artist. By the way, it does actually relate to Italian uh, dough or mixture or paste. But anyway, the thing that really struck me was um, how you could actually see the actual board of the canvas, especially at the bottom of Starry Night. And that is how quickly he painted it, that he actually left pieces of the original board underneath visible. I uh, really didn't think that that would be the case. And I don't know if you can see here. I'll just wait for it to load. Not sure why it's taking so long. And then it failed. Anyway, if you look over there, can you see 
that that's actually bare on that side over there. If you look very carefully, you can actually see slight areas where you can actually see the canvas underneath. You wouldn't notice it even like over there. That's the canvas underneath. I don't know why it's not. I um, wonder if I can download this. Seems like it's a really big file. 176 megabytes. That should, I don't know why it's taking so long to download. Anyway, so that really surprised me was that uh, Story Night seemed even unfinished. It seemed, uh, it seemed to be executed very roughly. Um, I was surprised at that, um, that, that you could actually see the canvas through the paint. I think I've got some photos of that as well. Let's see if I can, Timmy, let me put you down. I'll see if I can uh, magnify this to, to show you what I mean. Can you see that is actually the canvas over there? So throughout this entire painting, you can actually see the canvas. Look at that. Even in this, this, the, the thickness of the cypress, there are areas where you can see the canvas. And again, that kind of gives you a sense of the speed at which this was executed. Because, I mean, literally everywhere is, there's, there's the canvas, and there you can see it going through. And Story Night really looks like it is um, the thick paste of paint, and although they are thick smears, um, even in the thickest areas, I mean, all over you've got these, you've got the canvas actually um, peeking through, and it, it almost feels like part of the half of the painting is is not painting, is just the canvas, because just look at how much is is bare. It's like everywhere. It's and it's not like one little area that he missed. It's it's vast areas where you know it's almost like the painting. It's almost like he has too little butter for too much bread. It's like like he just doesn't have enough um, paint to cover the painting. You know, and that is definitely a surprise. You can choose the um, area where you think is the most uh, color, and then you'll find that there's the bare, look at that, there's the bare canvas behind it as well. And as I said, it's across the entire painting. And I, I kind of noticed it when I looked at the very bottom and I sort of leaned forward and I noticed the very bottom of it is actually cut off here. But the bottom is very similar to the side. It sort of looks like that, where it just stops painting. And you sort of see that sort of effect. And that's a very surprising uh, uh, aspect to Starry Night, just the... This, this painting that is supposedly one of the most hallowed paintings in Western art is actually um, um, only half there, in a way. So in a way, what you're seeing is what you 
um, almost imagine. It's almost some of what you're seeing isn't what's really there. It's, it's kind of what you're imagining. And I, and I think part of that animated feeling is from that the, the subtlety of the canvas kind of coming through, adding texture to the whole thing. Let me put it on full screen. I mean, just have a look at that. The cypress tree looks like a cypress tree, right? And then as you get closer, you can, you're almost like seeing right through it. That's the canvas underneath. Kind of surprising, right? Okay. So he says, um, now to get up heat enough to melt that gold, those flower tones, it isn't any old person who can do it. It needs the force and concentration of a single individual, whole and entire. What a what a wonderful sentiment, right? What a wonderful sentiment there to say, you know, I need to be whole to to build up enough psychological heat enough motivation to melt gold to melt the gold uh, the golden inspiration in my heart and 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 use the liquid to make the, those flower tones then he says when i saw my can okay, come have, come on come 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 to me, come, come, come on. He says, when I saw my canvases again after my illness, the one that seemed the best to me was the bedroom. The amount we handle is a respectable enough sum, I admit. Come, come on. Come, come. I'm not going to help you up. Come, come. Okay. When I saw my canvases again after my illness, the one that seemed the best to me was the bedroom. The amount we handle is a respectable enough sum, I admit, but much of it runs away. And what we'll have to watch above all is that from year's end to year's end, it doesn't all slip through the net. I wonder what he means by the amount we handle. Does he mean money? emotion, um, inspiration. He says, that is why as the month goes on, I keep more or less trying to balance the outlay with the output, at least in relative terms. Does he mean the amount of art that he produces? So many difficulties certainly do make me rather worried and timorous, but I haven't given up hope yet. And again, this shows his resilience, doesn't it? The trouble I foresee is that we shall have to be very prudent so as to prevent the expenses of a sale, lowering the sale itself when the time for it comes. How many times we have had occasion to see just that mischance in the lives of artists. I have in, in hand the portrait of Roulan's wife. So he's still talking about this portrait. Uh, uh, not quite, you know, her face almost looks like a Simpson. Um, Anyway, which I was working on before I was ill. In it, I had ranged the reds from pink to an orange, which rises through the yellows to lemon with light and somber greens. If I could finish it, I should be very glad. But I'm afraid she will no longer want to pose with her husband away. That's an interesting comment. You can see just what a disaster Gauguin's leaving is. Now, what I want to emphasize with that comment uh, what have I just done? Um, what I want to emphasize with this this comment is just how understated Van Gogh can be, right? He says, 
he calls to his brother, he calls Gauguin's leaving a disaster. And it is. You know, you can't uh, describe it any other way. He loses his ear. He nearly dies. I mean, you know, no one really seems to talk about that. Van Gogh nearly dies in the process. You know, he loses so much blood through, because of an artery that goes in here, right? And he loses so much blood that he comes very close to death. And in fact, when the police find him there, they think he is dead, right? It's a disaster because his brother, who's about to get engaged, who's gotten engaged, has got to come all the way to all, basically for nothing, to chaperone the spoiled Gauguin back to wherever he wants to go. And then Gauguin sends a telegram, which is very expensive. So that then leads to a financial disaster. The, the ear incident also leads to a financial disaster in terms of medical expenses. And then it leads to the, although he doesn't really realize it so much here, the disaster is not over. He's going to get kicked out of the town and then be in an, in an asylum for a year. That, that is a very big disaster for him personally. But in and of itself, it's a disaster. You know, Van Gogh, his whole life was quite a lonely guy. You know, he hasn't had a lot of friends. It's not that he has no friends or that he has no girlfriends, but through the course of 37 years, it's a friend here and a friend there, a mistress here, a girlfriend there. But overall, it's a solitary life. And the, that, that loneliness is really what eats him the most. You know, he gets some joy scratching with his paints and, you know, all of that kind of thing. But make no mistake, uh, even though he, he came very close to losing his life, he, almost equal with that disaster is the, the, the sort of social death of someone who re he really admired, someone he, he considered a friend, um, coming and then leaving after two months. That's a disaster as well. You know, this artist colony that he tried to set up. But what I'm trying to impress upon you guys is he says to his brother that, it's, that, that Gauguin's leaving is a disaster. And yet to Gauguin himself, it's a much milder message, right? He says, I'm not a little put out by my friend's departure. That's a very um, mild, euphemistic way of calling it a disaster. There he says, left behind alone on board my little yellow house. Um, I'm not a little put out. That's nowhere near calling it what it is which is a catastrophe. To Kuenung, he, he also says, what does he say? Um, I'll, I'll leave the solving of these problems to casual discussions. He doesn't say to Kuenung that it's a disaster. And it is a disaster. So I'm just letting you know that this guy does have, he doesn't like wear absolutely everything on his sleeve. He has mental resilience, right? He has mental resilience. He's capable of having nerves like iron. I mean, could you go through five years as a salesperson, as whatever, without a single result, without kind of losing your mind a little bit? Imagine writing a book and you don't sell a single book or you a salesperson in a jewelry store and you never sell a single item or your, your job is to sell Thrive products and you never sell a single one, and five years later you still add it. Well, that's what Van Gogh was doing. He's a mentally strong guy, much, much more mentally strong than most people. And so to his brother, he says what it is. It was a disaster because it has thrust us down again just when we had made a home it has thrust us down. In other words, it's almost like someone has knocked us out. We've, we've, it's been like a knockout blow. Just when we had made a home and furnished it to take in our friends in bad times. 
only in spite of it will we keep the furniture, and though everyone will now be afraid of me in time, that may disappear. So he's aware that people are gossiping around him unfairly, but perhaps understandably. And he's actually wrong about that. If anything, in time, the myth around him is going to grow uh, because he doesn't clarify things, people, the whole fake news things get, get totally out of hand. We are all mortal and subject to all the ailments there are, but if the latter aren't exactly of an agreeable kind, what can one do about it? The best thing is to try to get rid of them. I feel remorse too when I think of the trouble that, however involuntarily, I on my side caused Gauguin. And this is the difference between Van Gogh and Gauguin. Can you ever imagine Gauguin expressing um, self-reproach? Can you ever imagine Gauguin um, apologizing even? And that's the other side to Van Gogh's resilience. He's a very humble, kind of a, a pathetic person, but, but there's a kind of a humble um, humbleness with that. And so he blames himself. And it's easy to take that self-blame and turn it into, he cut off his own ear. It's easy to take that self-blame and turn it into, he took his own life. Then he says, but up to the last days, I saw one thing only, that he was working with his mind divided between the desire to go to Paris to carry out his plans and the life at all. And that tells you everything, right? He says, up to the last days, I just saw one thing. His mind was divided between the desire to go to Paris to carry out his plans. In other words, this is the difference. Van Gogh was thinking about his friend. I mean, in a way, thinking about himself. I want a companion. But he's far more self-effacing. He does far more for someone else than he does for himself. Whereas Gauguin, Gauguin's thing was all about himself. Then he says, what will come of all this for him? You will doubtless be feeling that though you have a good salary, nevertheless, we lack capital, except in goods, and that in order really to alter the unhappy position of the artist that we know, we need to be in a stronger position. But then we often run up against sheer distrust on their part and the things they are perpetually scheming among themselves. So, again, doesn't this paint Gauguin in a bit of a bad light? that he was scheming, that he was distrusting. And then he says, which always end in a, a blank. I think that at Pont Arvin, they've already formed a new group of five or six, perhaps already broken up. Now bear in mind, in all, Van Gogh was trying to create an artist colony. Well, that only lasted about two months. He says, they are not dishonest. It is something without a name and one of their infant terrible faults. What do you think he means by that? Enfant terrible. <laughs> That's the right way to say it. Enfant terrible. Enfant terrible. Enfant terrible. Enfant terrible. Enfant terrible. So, you know, what he's specifically referring to is um, a child whose inopportune remarks cause embarrassment, a person known for shocking remarks, <coughs> a young and successful person who is strikingly unorthodox. Right? And so he's referring to Gauguin essentially as someone who's just really badly behaved. And I don't know, I suppose you could say the same about Van Gogh, but obviously Gauguin is more badly behaved, he's got less scruples than Van Gogh does. Would you guys agree with that? 
there's another description. Well, it was actually the same one. Meantime, the great thing is that your marriage should not be delayed. By getting married, you will set mother's mind at rest and make her happy. Now, again, does this sound like someone... Remember the um, the official version, or certainly a, a version from the sort of top art expert, is that Van Gogh cut off his ear because he heard that his brother was getting married. Now his brother's talking about his brother's marriage to his brother. Is there anything, any kind of reservation, any fear? I mean, his, talk, his fear seems to be directed at the art community. Look at what he says here. He says, he talks about the great thing referring to the marriage. It shouldn't be delayed. Uh, um, it's going to set mother's mind at rest and make her happy. And it is, after all, almost a necessity in view of your position in society and in commerce. Will it be appreciated by the society to which you belong? Perhaps not. And that's, that is an interesting comment. You know, will artists appreciate that? any more than the artist ever suspected I've sometimes worked and suffered for the community. So from me, your brother, you will not want completely ordinary congratulations and assurances that you are about to be transported into paradise. And with your wife, you will not be lonely anymore, which I could wish for our sister as well. And I think that is how Van Gogh actually sees it. Because he is quite a lonely guy. He's basically thinking, congratulations, you're not going to be lonely anymore. Then he says that after your own marriage is what I should set my heart on more than anything. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. What do you think he means? That after your own marriage is what I should set my heart on more than anything. Does he mean he should set his heart on his brother's marriage or he should set his heart on a similar marriage. When you are married, perhaps there will be other marriages in the family, and in any case, you will see your way clear, and the house will not be empty anymore. Whatever I think on other points, our father and mother were exemplary as married people. I don't know, like, do you get a sense that he's got reservations? And I shall never forget mother at father's death when she said, only one small word. It made me begin to love dear old mother more than before. In fact, as married people, our parents were exemplary, like Roulon and his wife, to cite another instance. So he seems to have positive role models for marriage. His own parents and Roulon. Anyway, he says, well, go straight ahead along that road. During my illness, I saw again Every room of the house at Zundert, every path, every plant in the garden, the views from the fields round about, the neighbors, the graveyard, the church, our kitchen garden behind, um, down to the magpie's nest in a tall acacia, uh, down to the magpie's nest in a tall acacia in the graveyard. So he kind of has a vision of home during his convalescence. It's because I still have earlier recollections of those first days than any of the rest of you. There's no one left who remembers all this but mother and me. I say no more about it since it is better that I should not try to recall all that passed through my head then. Only please realize that I shall be very happy when your marriage has taken place. There it is in his own words. Um, look here now, if for your wife's sake it would perhaps be as well to have a picture of mine from time to time at Gupil's. So he is basically saying, you know what, your, your wife may not like Joe who's going to be Vincent's champion, 
in the coming years is saying, you know, she may not like my pictures in the house. Maybe you should keep them at Goupil's. Well, this is this is the future. There's, there's his wife and there's his art still in, in their house. There's that one as well. I wonder if we can find that, that particular picture. Let me try one more time. Isn't it um, haystacks in all, something like that? Now, is it one of these pictures? Keep feeling I'm about, oh, there it is. Isn't it that one? It's gonna say, I'm about to see it and then I did see it. Isn't that the picture? Let's uh, bring back the original. Right, have a look at that picture. There's a little haystack over there and then there's some dark, bushes in the foreground and then look at this one isn't that it there's that little pyramid there those bushes in the foreground there's that wagon over there right there's a funny white shaped object over there and some more over there right do you agree that that is that picture so you know if you Consider that that's a black and white picture, and this is actually what was on the wall. You realize just how much is taken away by the, the fact that there's no color. Of course, photography at this stage was still a fairly new thing. At, uh, at the time, it was considered quite modern. Anyway. Timmy, stop snoring. So you're saying, you know what, your wife might want my pictures at Goupil's, but, you know, I think the fact that his art was kind of in her face made her realize, it, it kind of made her think about it, it kind of put the art into her, um, what's the word, uh, into her, um, headspace, heart space, and it started to have an effect on her. And and as a result, let's put, it, put this another way. If Van Gogh's art had never um, been kept in the, the home, you know, they were always just put in a warehouse somewhere. Joe's wife may have never formed a connection to it. I know that my friend Alex, I gave him some photos of um, some of it was like black and white photography of, uh, I think he actually bought that, but I also gave him some photos that I took of his children. And I remember at his wedding, um, I, I, well, before his wedding, I played him some music and then he liked it so much, he kept that CD, right? And I quite liked that CD, but the important thing to, to say is, you know, if you have something that that is hanging on your wall for 10 or 20 years, you, you form a, an attachment to it. It becomes almost like a family pet or a family member. It's, it's part of who you are. And so those paintings not being there, you know, if, if um, 
here I just found, found some other way of dealing with them, or, or also if Van Gogh's output had been less, that they, they would have been easy to store perhaps in one room, then it wouldn't have had such a impact on Joe, would it? Anyway, he goes on to say, um, he, he talks about, I will give up my grudge against them, meaning Gupil, in this way. I said I did not want to go back to them with too naive a picture. But if you like, you can exhibit the two pictures of sunflowers. Gauguin would be glad to have one, and I should very much like to give Gauguin a real pleasure. Seems sincere, doesn't it? So if he wants one of the two canvases, all right. I will do one of them over again, whichever he likes. Now, can you see what a nice person Van Gogh is? I mean, in the same letter, he describes what Gauguin did to him as a disaster, not just to him, to them. Right? You can, you can see just what a disaster Gauguin's leaving is. And then in the same breath, he's talking about giving Gauguin... I, I, would, I should very much like to give Gauguin a real pleasure. You really do get a sense of, of Van Gogh as a martyr figures, as a very, someone with a very big heart. I mean, would you, even if Gauguin hadn't cut off his ear, but had just left him, would you want to give him any kind of gift? I wouldn't. So if he wants one of the two canvases, all right. You will see that these canvases will catch the eye, but I would advise you to keep them for yourself, just for your own private pleasure and that of your wife. It is a kind of painting that rather changes in character and takes on a richness the longer you look, look at it. I must say Van Gogh's art does have that quality. It seems to do that. Besides, you know, Gauguin likes them extraordinarily. He said to me, among other things, that's that it's the flower. You know that the peony is Janine's, the hollyhock belongs to, to Quast, but the sunflower is somewhat my own. And after all, I should go on exchanging my things with Gauguin, even if sometimes it would cost me also rather dear. Did you know during your hasty visit, did you, did you during your hasty visit see the portrait of Mademoiselle Ginou in black and yellow? It was painted in three quarters of an hour. I must stop for the moment. Now, Masa, I don't think that that is terribly good. That's like a alien version of The Simpsons. The delay of the money was pure chance, and neither you nor I could do anything about it. A handshake, ever yours, Vincent. Okay. Are we about to exit January, 28th January, what's the next one? 30th January, and then we out, okay. Let's have a look at some of your comments. I think you're right. And I think Iceland's also right. And I think Helena's also right. I don't know if you guys remember, um, I think before, before Vincent left Paris, he suggested to his brother that he would marry his brother's girlfriend. Like his brother's girlfriend was kind of... Um, there was some some issue, and I think he was trying to get rid of it. And, and I think Van Gogh basically offered, or well, how about if I marry her? Maybe that'll solve the problem. So make that of make of that what you will. Anyway, let's uh, let's continue. Twenty eighth. January. This is the next one, right?
My dear Theo, only a few words to tell you that my health and my work are not progressing so badly. It astonishes me already when I compare my condition today with what it was a month ago. Before that, I knew well enough that one could fracture one's legs and arms and recover afterward. But I did not know that you could fracture the brain in your head and recover from that too. That's quite a um, statement, especially ahead of him going to the asylum, right? I still have a sort of what is the good of getting better feeling about me, even in the astonishment aroused in me by getting well, which I hadn't dared hope for. So you can see where his brother is quite um, authentic. You know, he's quite plain in saying that he, he is a little fragile. He's thinking, what is the good of getting better? I'm not going to sell my art. During, my, during your visit, I think you must have noticed the size 30 canvases of sunflowers in Gauguin's room. I've just put the finishing touches to copies, absolutely identical repl replicas of them. I think I've already told you that besides these, I have a canvas of La Bercuse. Now, by the way, him making those identical replicas certainly added to the value. I, they would probably not be identical, but certainly similar. But added to the number, the series of sunflowers. I mean, is that really identical? Looks to me slightly different. So, you know, take it with a bit of license when he says absolutely identical. I mean, it's not like phot phot photographic um, replicas. He says, I've got two versions of La Bercus as well. I've just said to Gauguin about this picture that when he and I were talking about the fishermen of Iceland and of their mournful isolation, he's obvious, they were obviously comparing their own loneliness to, to that, exposed to all dangers, alone on the sad sea. I just said to Gauguin that following those intimate talks of ours, the idea came to me to paint a picture in such a way that sailors who, had, who are at once children and martyrs, seeing, and there he uses the word himself. He's very aware of that term, right? What is a martyr? What's a martyr? Martyr. It is a person who is killed because of their beliefs. Someone who is made a martyr of. Someone who is um, thrown to the lions. Someone who is destroyed in a way. Um, because of some kind of symbolic reason. And isn't that ultimately Van Gogh's story, that he was a martyr for his art? Anyway, and, and he seems to like the idea. Seeing it in the cabin of the Icelandic fishing boat would feel the old sense of being rocked come over them and remember their own lullabies. Now it may be said that, and I, although I think he... Um, he, he has a good idea in his mind. I don't really think he successfully executes it. Um, now it may be said that it is like a chromo lithograph from a cheap shop. A woman in green with orange hair standing out against a background of green with pink flowers. Now these discordant shops of crude pink, crude orange and crude green are softened by flats of red and green. Now maybe if you are in Iceland, and you see all of that green and red, maybe it does warm you a little bit. Maybe if you're on a boat and everything around you is black rock and ice and and um, and you're lonely, maybe that picture will give you some fire in your belly. I picture to myself these same canvases between those of the sunflowers 
which would thus form touches or candelabra beside them, the same size. And so the whole, the whole would be composed of seven or nine canvases. I should like to make another duplicate for Holland if I could get hold of the model again. Since it is still winter, look here, let me go quietly on with my work. If it is that of a madman, well, so much the worse. I can't help it. Right, so there's a little bit of a appeal. Please let me go on with my work, um, even if it's, even if no one can understand it. Well, after all of that effort looking for this painting, well, here it is. So he does talk about having hallucinations. He talks about it here and he talks about it there. He says, however, the unbearable hallucinations have ceased and are now getting reduced to a simple nightmare in consequence of my taking bromide or potassium, I think. It is still beyond my powers to go into the details of this money question. And yet I want to do that very thing. And I am furiously at work from morning till night to prove to you, unless my work is another hallucination, to prove to you that indeed and indeed we are following Monticelli's track. Again, can you see what a resilient guy he is? Even though he is struggling, I mean, he's, he's been earless for barely a month. He, he hasn't even taken a couple of days off um, to recuperate. He's painted his doctor. He's painted, um, you know, uh, the sunflowers. He's done quite a lot of work just in January when he really didn't need to. And yet he, he says in his own words, I'm furiously at work. All I'm trying to say is, can you see, even in a situation of being... Um, put out, his motivation is still there. I'm furiously at work. Then he says, don't be too amazed if during the next month I shall be obliged to ask you for the month's money in full and some extra money as well. After all, it is only right that during periods of productivity on which I spend all my vital warmth, I shall insist on what is necessary in order to take a few precautions. This painting is called Hope. Even in that case, the difference in expenditure is certainly not excessive on my part. And once again, either shut me up in a madhouse right away, I, I shan't oppose it, for I may be deceiving myself, or else let me work with all my strength while taking the precautions I speak of. If I am not mad, the time will come when I shall send you what I promised. And so it is within this context of, am I mad or am I not mad? Other people think I'm mad that he paints this picture. So within the context of conversations about madness, about his mental stability, that he paints that painting. Now perhaps the pictures are less bound to be dispersed, but when you, when you for one see the whole that is in my mind, I dare hope it will make a comforting impression on you. You saw as I did, part of the f f four collection being passed in review one by one in the little window of that picture, picture frame shop in the Rue Lafitte, didn't you? Like me, you saw that this slow succession of once despised canvases was strangely interesting. In a weird way, he's prognosticating, he's telling the future of his own art. And, you know, when he talks about once despised canvases, well, canvases that he once, <coughs> not necessarily despised, but was quite dismissive of, <laughs> Yeah. Um, his own work that he was once dismissive of, others would find strangely interesting. Okay, I need to uh, fill up a glass of water. Give me, give me a couple of minutes, just about three minutes, and then I'll see you guys in a moment. You can follow on this 
letter in the meantime to me. Okay, Stephanie, thanks for joining us. I hope you guys have a good dinner. Iceland says, thanks for this live today. Why do you say that? Did you need it? Um, are you in need of some inspiration? Okay, so he says, um, my great desire would be that sooner or later you should have a series of canvases of mine which might likewise march past in just that same window. Now by continuing this furious work during next February and March, so that is what is uh, I see. <laughs> okay. Um, that is what he's projecting for himself. He obviously gives himself quite a positive prognosis. You know, he can see himself um, painting in a effective way going into February and March. He says, I shall hope to have finished the quietly composed repetitions of a number of studies I made last year. And these, together with some canvases you have already, excuse me, you already had from me, such as the harvest. That's, that, that to me is, um, what do you guys think? Isn't that one of Van Gogh's most beautiful paintings? It's just got such a great balance about it. I mean, that is almost the rural version of the village under, under the Starry Night. I mean, these are the mountains, effectively, of the Starry Night. By the way, I've, I've actually cycled um, through these mountains, and it was exhausting. Um, you know, I eventually got off my, like the mistral was playing head on, and I, w I eventually got off my bike and I was just pushing the bike. I was like, there's no way I'm going to turn back and just go back. I was actually very dumb because the people I stayed with, I stayed at a, uh, Airbnb, they said, don't go through the Les Alps. And so what did I do? I went through the Les Alps. And although it was an adventure and it was very scenic, etc., it was extremely hard. And the, the joke was coming back the other way, way was just ab so absurdly easy. It was flat and straight and simple. But anyway, what you see over here in this picture is the Abbey. I also went there. I cycled there on the way there. And then saint Rami is just on the other side of these mountains. Um, so I cycled from all to this Abbey, wandered a bit around here, and then cycled from there. And all of it is very gradually uphill to to there or there, and then saint is on the other side. So Starry Night was painted just on the other side of these mountains, the same sky. OK. 
Okay. And he also talks about the white orchard. I'm not crazy about that. Then he says, um, by that same time, not later than March, that is, we can arrange what there is to arrange on the occasion of your marriage. So he seems to be thinking about painting a painting for Theo's marriage. And, you know, it's shortly, shortly after, I think, Theo got married that he painted Starry Night. Let me just see if I can get the exact date, date of Theo's marriage. Seventeen April, eighteen eighty nine. It's very close to the time Vincent painted Story Night. Pretty much in the ballpark. Snow Lion, people have been worried about you. Some folks on Patreon have been saying, "Are you okay? Where are you?" Etc. Um, thanks, Iceland. Appreciate that. So I don't know about you guys. I've learned quite a lot just um, in this this live, and I hope you guys have. I'm a little bit disappointed in the. I uh, thought there might be a few more people watching, but I, I guess it's a select audience that's interested in this, and 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 that have longer attention spans. Anyway, um, he says, during February and March, though working, I shall go and considering myself an invalid and tell you beforehand that for those two months, I shall perhaps have to take 250 a month from the year's allowance. That's quite uh, a statement from him. You know, an invalid is basically a disabled person. You'll perhaps understand, so you're kind of making pretty big financial demands. You'll perhaps understand that what would reassure me in some fashion as to my illness and the possibility of a relapse would be to see that Gauguin and I had not exhausted our brains for nothing, but that some good canvases have come out of it. And I, so, you know, if you try and integrate all the things he's talking about here with our theory. What does he mean by a relapse? So, you know, it does make one think that did Van Gogh's health, um, uh, how can I put it, D did his health betray him in a way? In other words, that he started getting sick and needed Gauguin. And I'm talking about, you know, in, in the sense of syphilis, needed Gauguin, then it perhaps had a bit of a breakdown, and then Gauguin was like, geez, I'm not going to be looking after this um, sack of self-pity, right? But it does make you think that maybe there was a little bit of mental breakdown uh, that took place. There certainly is when he's in the asylum. Um, and it's kind of understandable, you know. Um, this guy comes along, they party, and then the guy be totally betrays him. Um, you know, you can kind of imagine there's a bit of a breakdown taking place. This whole possibility of a relapse is very related to syphilis. Um, you know, if you don't eat properly, if you don't get enough rest, if you don't um, change your lifestyle, you will have a relapse and you'll get sick again. I dare to hope that someday you will see that by keeping steady and straight in this money business, in the longer run, it will prove to be impossible that you have acted against the interests of the Goupils. Incidentally, um, Theo is going to die of syphilis as well. It's not like Van Gogh was the special case. And so will, uh, so will Gauguin, right? So um, if anything, um, it's quite crazy to think about. Although Theo is about to marry Joe, Theo 
Theo's syphilis seems to be more advanced than his brothers. Bear in mind, Theo dies at barely the age of 35, right? And Van Gogh died at 37. So Theo died even younger than his brother. <clears throat> then he says, but if I should have eaten their bread indirectly th through you as an intermediary, in that case, my integrity would be directly involved. Then, however, far from going on feeling more or less embarrassed by each other because of it, we shall be able to feel even more like brothers after that has been arranged. You will have gone on being poor all the time in order to support me, but I will give you back the money or give up the ghost. Meanwhile, this tender-hearted wife of yours will have to come and will make us old fellows almost young again. But this I believe, that you and I will have successes in our business, and that just as when the family, financially speaking, abandoned us to our own resources, once again, it will be we who never flinched. And again, this is just a sign of this guy's resilience. And after that, the deluge, you know, it's not like he's unaware of his affliction. It's not like he's um, in denial or, or in a state of ignorance. He's aware of things like relapses and um, his own fragility. But he's also willing and trying to work through it. He's trying not to flinch. Fancy that, like, you lose an ear, you nearly bleed to death, and then you say, well, I'm not going to flinch. Then he says, after that, the deluge. Am I wrong in this? Indeed, as long as this world lasts, so long will there be artists and picture dealers, especially those who, like you, are at the same time apostles. Quite a nice compliment to make for his, to his brother. What I'm telling you is true. If it is not absolutely necessary to shut me up in a cell, well, that is quite an ominous statement he's saying because he, he will soon be, then I'm still good for paying, at least in goods, what I'm considered to owe. In conclusion, I still have to tell you that the chief superintendent of police, who says um, Van Gogh is not about true crime, I still have to tell you that the chief superintendent of police paid me a very friendly visit yesterday. He told me as he shook hands that if I ever needed him, I should consult him as a friend. I'm far from refusing that, and I may soon be in just that position if they raise difficulties about the house. Quite interesting, right? May I speak freely? You may. Um, I'm waiting till the time comes for me to pay the month's rent to interview the agent or the proprietor face to face. But if they try to kick me out, they will find themselves tripped up this time anyhow. Guess what? It's not an if. They are going to try and kick him out. They are going to try and kick him out. What would you... We have gone all out for the Impressionists, and now as far as it's in my power, I'm trying to finish canvases, which will undoubtedly secure me the little corner that I've claimed. Ah, the future of it all. But since old Pangloss assures us that everything is always for the best in the best of worlds, can we doubt it? My letter's grown longer than I intended, but it doesn't matter. The main thing is that I'm asking categorically for two months' work before making the arrangements which will have to be made at the time of your marriage. After that, in the spring, you and your wife will found a commercial house for several generations. It will not be too easy, and that's settled. I only ask the position of a painting employee, at least as long as there is enough to pay one. Now, again, you get a sense that he is apologetic, that he feels like everything is going to change. Does he ever say to his brother, Chief, is you getting married? Uh, do you want me to stop painting? He insists on painting. He's telling his brother that things are going better than ever. He 
he um, congratulates his brother, and, and if anything, I think he envies him a little bit. The work distracts my mind, and I must have some distraction. Yesterday, I went to the Folies Olysiennes, the budding theater here. It was the first time that I stepped without a bad nightmare. Now, you know, what he's saying, seems to be saying, is that he slept without a nightmare for the first time in more than a month. It's the 28th of January. So the fact that he's having nightmares tells you that he's trying very hard to overcome the struggle that he's in. It's funny, do you remember in the previous episode, we spoke about why is it important to dream? And um, I actually since had an extremely visual and disturbing dream. Um, it happened probably three or four, four nights later. And um, the dream um, is to some extent, I think, anchored in reality. A friend of mine um, is losing her home. Um, in the sense that the people who own the house, she rents, the people that own the house want to sell the house. And so she's losing her home. Um, she doesn't really have, um, anyway, I'm not going to go through too much of the details, but shortly after hearing about her efforts to find somewhere else to stay, I just had this dream of like, um, there was like, an earthquake or something and her house um the, the floor kind of went like this and then it cracked in in a slanted way and then at the edge of the floor it was on fire and um so not only had her home been sort of destroyed kind of in an earthquake where you know the roof had fallen in and the walls had fallen in, um, a lot of the house was made out of wood. This was now burning, and in the dream, I wanted to try and just save some of her possessions, but now it's a a, a wooden floor that's already kind of um, collapsed, and it's on fire, and it's on kind of a high precipice, and. Um, so I wanted to go in and just see if I could rescue some of her things. And then the next thing I was like in this weird landscape um, where it was sort of near the coast or something. And I was sort of in dunes, but there were sort of curved kind of rocks. And these, uh, the, the, the earth was again moving like this. So I was like somewhere in um on a on a landscape and the and the earth was literally shaking around me and now i was now i couldn't find where this house was that i was supposed to try and just rescue some of her things and then the next thing that i was somewhere else in the dream i mean it's now quite a few days ago i can't quite remember it that well but um it went from fire to I was trying to get from somewhere to somewhere else and again just struggling and and i was swimming through, uh, it, although it was a road i was swimming through this road and cars had been parked on both sides of the road that they had now floated upwards and they sort of started float started um floating closer together and this caused a, a massive deluge of water through this narrow channel that these cars were kind of making and one of the cars that I swam by had three dogs in it, and I was trying to save the dogs, you know. And so I guess the dream was about this impossible situation I was in where I was trying to save things when the whole world was kind of falling apart. It was, it was in a way, quite a terrifying dream. Um, 
and I guess the, the point of that dream was to try and give give a sense of um, stability to something that I was feeling, some sense of instability that I was feeling. So anyway. Anyway, I'll um, stop indulging in my own dreams and let's get back to his nightmares. He says, they were giving, it is a provincial literary society, what they call a Noel or pastoral, reminiscent of the Middle Ages. It was a very carefully studied performance, must have cost him a lot of money. It represented, of course, the birth of Christ, mixed up with the burlesque of a family of gaping provincial peasants. But the amazing thing about it, like Rembrandt etching, was the, like a Rembrandt etching, was the old peasant woman, just such a mother as Mademoiselle Tangi with a head of silex or flint, dishonest, treacherous, silly, all this very evident from the preceding scenes. Now in the play, that woman, led before the mystic crib, began to sing in her quavering voice, and then the voice changed, changed from the voice of a witch to that of an angel, and from an angel's voice to a child's, and then the answer came in another voice, strong and warm and vibrant, the voice of a woman behind the scenes. It's quite interesting how this made quite an impression on him. This person that transforms from a witch to an angel. He says, it was amazing. I can tell you that these so-called Philippres had certainly put themselves to expense. As for me, being in this little country of mine, I have no need at all to go to the tropics. I believe I shall always believe in the art that is to be created in the tropics. And I think it will be marvelous, but personally, I'm too old. Bear in mind, he was only 35 at this point, I think. Especially if I have a paper mache ear put on. That's a very rare reference to his own ear. You don't really hear him talking about his ear very often. So I think he is worried that if he puts a paper mache ear on and he goes to the tropics, it might melt off. Will Gauguin do it? It is not essential, for if this ought to be done, it will happen of itself. We are nothing but links in a chain. Old Gauguin and I understand each other basically, and if, and yeah, he says, we are a bit mad, right? So, you know, how seriously should you take him saying, I'm mad, I'm mad, and then he, he, he includes Gauguin in that? Aren't we also thoroughly artists enough to contradict suspicions on that score? by what we say with our brush. Perhaps someday everyone will have neuroses, St. Vitus's dance or something else. Well, I think I think Van Gogh is um, right about that. Um, I think today we live in a very neurotic society, right? We live in a society that's narrowed down to the cell phone. We live in a society that he might describe as neurosis, um, psychologically disordered, as mentally disturbed. You know, where we are um, staring at our phones all day, right? So neurosis is all of these things, but it's it's mostly um, being obsessive. It's mostly um, narrowing down. Um, there's a, a being, it, it, there is a sense of being out of touch with reality, but it's not, psych, it's not psychosis. It's not a radical loss of reality, but it certainly is starting to lose touch with reality. It's a, a narrowing down of, um, of the world. Um, and it's things like obsession, phobia, fixation, right? What is a neurotic person like? Anxious, depressed, irritable, self-conscious. Starting to feel overwhelmed. So that's what he says, maybe someday people are gonna be like that in general. But doesn't the antidote exist in Delacroix, in Berlioz, and Wagner? And really, as for, as for the artist madness of all the rest of us, I do not say that I am especially not infected through and through. 
And, you know, doesn't he seem to be talking about madness in a symbolic way, like in a as allegory, almost like he's talking about um, someone who is very interested in something, you know, like a craze, um, a, like a phase you go through where you very caught up in something. Do you think it, it means literal insanity? Because if he does, this is an extremely um, lucid letter for someone who, who is mad. He, he's, saying, he's saying that he's infected with a dedication to, to uh, paint, effectively. Then he says, I say and will maintain that our antidotes and consolations may with a little goodwill be considered ample compensation. Ever yours, Vincent. And then he refers to that painting. Okay, last letter from the month of January. Shall we read it in French? Bria, are you here? Um, Tim is fine. It's just... Um, he did go for a nice little walk earlier. He is fine. Mon cher Theo, Tutin, blah, blah, blah. Let's switch back to English. Okay, so the last letter in, in January. Now, what I want you to do, we're going to read this last letter, but what I want you to do is um, between now and next week is I want you to try and think about what is going on in Van Gogh's heart and mind in January. This is, you can, you can have a look at this letter and you can obviously go backwards and forwards if you like. But the whole thing I want us to talk about and discuss is how is, is remember this is all about the journey to Starry Night. Um, what happens in January? What happens in February? And what happens in March? What is the trajectory? Right? And so kind of in a broad sense, what happens in the one month that can be contrasted to what happens in the next month that can be contrasted to what happens in the, in the month after that? We're trying to understand how Story Night came about. You know, it's almost like an athlete who's, who's training for... Um, a race where he ends up winning the gold medal, except he doesn't actually know that he's training for it. How does he end up painting this um, work that is so beloved by mankind? How does it happen? And I think you'll find that part of the answer is that he himself goes to this incredible, extraordinary spectrum of the human experience. You know, there's there's life and death, there's um, summer and winter, there is, you know, um, there is sickness and health, there's his brother who's getting married, there's love and loss, there's love and betrayal, there's blood, sweat and tears, there's, you know, the, the creation of a home, you know, for the first time in his entire life, he's, he's, he's made a place of his own, only to lose it, right? It's one thing to just buy a place or to move in somewhere. It's, it's something completely different when you put all your hopes, when you put your heart into it, to then lose that as well, especially under these circumstances. You know, at the same time that he almost loses his life, he also loses um, all the work that he's put in. He, he loses so much momentum. At the moment that he reaches this, milestone in his life, you know, where he, his art starts to gain momentum, where he starts to, to find his way with his, with his brush. That's when he, he loses control over his life. That is devastating. And so we want to see to what extent his life um, weaves on, on its way to the worlds of Story Night. Does that make sense? So I hope some of you are going to do that. If you do, then please report back next week. 
when we do episode 74 and, and just tell me what you guys think basically just what happens in january what is basically the the sum of his emotional spiritual and physical journey in january okay so let's let's finalize this letter it's not a very long one if you've got any super chats uh pending <laughs> you you're welcome um okay so it says my dear Theo, though i have nothing very unusual to tell you i wanted to let you know that i saw our friend rulan again last monday there was enough reason for it too as the whole of france was shaken certainly in our eyes the election i think about you know it's 1889 and they're also aware of elections they're also troubled by leaders that perhaps you can trust or can't trust and he says and its representatives are only symbols but what it proves once more is that world ambition and fame pass away but the human heart beats the same to this day in as perfect sympathy with the past of our buried forefathers as with a generation to come that's quite a profound statement you know even if you have incredible leaders coming and going um they, they're only symbols um and great personalities come and go but the human spirit is the same throughout and it kind of resonates with the past right then he says i had a very friendly letter from gauguin this morning to which i, re I replied without delay when roulon came and I just finished the duplicate of my sunflowers. I, sh I, um, I showed him the two examples of La Bercuse with, with between the four bunches of flowers. Roulan sends his kind regards. He was present at the demonstration in Marseille on Sunday at the time that the election result was telegraphed from Paris. Like Paris, the whole population of Marseille was moved to the very depths of their soul. So, you know, they don't have TV, they don't have internet, they don't have radio, they don't have email, they don't have WhatsApp, they don't have social media, but they do have a telegraph. And that is something that is moving fairly quickly. Thank you so much, really. Wow, that's really generous of you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jalsi. Appreciate it. Does Team Peter have a post office box to receive gifts? No, unless not. But kind of you to to offer. Um, so this is quite a big moment. Um, I think a new leader has been elected. Also, the World Fair is going to be happening a couple of months later. I think he still thinks he's in the running for that. He still thinks he's preparing paintings for that, I guess, as well. Then he says, well, who is there now who will dare to order any gun at all to fire, machine gun or the bell rifle, when so many hearts have already offered themselves to serve as cannon fodder? All the more because certainly the victorious politicians of this great day, Rocheford and Bulanga, are with one accord more ambitious for a graveyard than for any throne. So quite um, grave commentary around the election, right? Anyhow, that was our interpretation of what has happened, not just Roulon's and mine, but many others. Nevertheless, we were greatly moved. Roulon told me that he almost cried when he saw that silent crowd at Marseille. You kind of get the sense that maybe the crowd didn't get the result that they wanted. And he only recovered himself when he turned and saw behind him some very, very old friends who stopped and happened to recognize him. Then they had supper together till late into the night. So a very kind of um, um, clear, almost visceral peek into a moment in kind of French society, you know, the end of January, 1889. Then he says, also meaning 
Roland was very tired. He could not resist the desire to come to Arles to see his family again. And he came to shake hands, almost dropping with sleep and very pale. I could just show him the two copies of the portrait of his wife, which pleased him very much. From what I am told, I am very obviously looking better. Inwardly, my heart is rather too full of so many feelings and divergent hopes, for I am amazed to be getting better. This tells you a lot. I mean, again, you must think of Starry Night, right? Think of this painting. Well, Bruni, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, think of this painting and these words. Inwardly, my heart is rather too full of many, so many feelings and divergent hopes. What, what do you think he means by divergent hopes? You know, it's like, if you think about it, one hope is I want to sell my art. But another hope might be I'd also like to get married. Another hope may be Gauguin is left, but maybe another artist will come here. He's got hopes in many different areas, right? Thanks so much, Bruni. I appreciate it. And then he says, I'm amazed to be getting better. And that sentiment will, will happen again. Um, he will deteriorate. And then towards the end of... Um, towards the end of the winter of the following year, he feels the same thing. Um, amazement to be getting better. And I guess as the weather warms, he, he, he feels stronger. Everyone here is kind to me, the neighbors, etc., kind and attentive as if I were at home. That's kind of a little bit misleading because he is about to get thrown out. I wouldn't say everyone is kind to him. Some are very suspicious of him. He says, I know already that several people here would ask me for portraits if they dared. Roulon, quite a poor fellow and a lowly employee though he is, is much respected. And it is known that I've done his whole family. My, my dear brother, in the meantime, we will certainly go on suffering, make mistakes, fall into misfortune. I can't deny it, but we will always have worked in this present 89 with the French, who we admire so much. And so, you know, if anything, if Vincent van Gogh speaks to us through time, it's almost as if he's saying, despite all the hardships, despite all the misfortunes, despite all the mistakes, we live during this amazing time with these people that we like so much. I don't know whether he's going to say he admires them so much a couple of weeks later. You know, he says, since on their part, they've made us feel that this is our homeland too. Still, that's the way they are. I've got to say, you know, I've traveled through France and it is a wonderful country. Um, I think what makes it feel, I looked at a map not that long ago that shows all the countries that South Africans have immigrated to, and they include Mozambique, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Israel, Germany, the Netherlands, and and the USA, and then of course Britain. And, and, of, and the country that I was kind of wondering which is missing is, is France. But the reason is um, language. And although France is a wonderful country, a very accessible country, um, also quite a friendly country, um, the language makes it feel a little less accessible than it would other, otherwise be. I do think France is the most, gets the most tourists in the world. Let me just check that. Most tourists, I think it's France, I think it's um, 70 million a year or something. Well, there you have it. Uh, France gets now about 80 million tourists a year, then Spain, then the United States. Let's have a look at a few more rows.
then uh, Turkey, Italy, Mexico, United Kingdom, Germany, Greece, Austria. Of those countries I've visited, Austria, I've never been to Greece, I've been to Germany, I've been to the United Kingdom, never been to Mexico, never been to Italy, never been to Turkey, I've been to these three as well. South Africa is only the third most visited country in Africa, but it is quite far to get to. Anyway, just a little bit of background there. So he says, don't speak to your fiance about this business between us. Just let me go on working in the same way. So, you know, if anything, you know, like if you're going to say that he felt um, afraid of his brother um, getting married, then this is his solution. Just don't tell your fiance about the money between us. That's the simple solution. You know, there's no sense of him thinking Theo's not going to give me any more money. Theo's always given him money. And after Theo got married, he continued giving his brother money. After Theo had a kid, he continued giving his brother money. So, you know, the whole thing that the art experts say didn't even happen. So, you know, who would know his brother best? Um, Theo knew Vincent very well and Vincent knew Theo very well. I get the idea that the art experts don't really know their relationship very well. But anyway, he says, just let me go on working in the same way. And Theo doesn't say, no, I'm not going to send you any more money. I'm not going to, I want you to stop painting. He doesn't say that. We can't see Theo's letters, but you kind of get the sense that Theo's going along with it, with it all, that Theo broadly is supporting his brother. I mean, is supporting his brother enough that he sends him money like clockwork almost daily and it's not like every second week they have an argument over money the money just keeps coming in and he's spending it mostly on art works not on not on um uh you know buying a camera and becoming a photographer or, um, right? Okay, then he says, today I'm working on a third book, Hughes. Doesn't look very different. I know very well that it is neither drawn nor painted as correctly as a Boguru. And I rather regret this because I have an earnest desire to be correct. But though it is doomed, uh, alas, to be neither Cabanel nor Bouguereau, yet I hope that it will be French. There's been a magnificent day with no wind, and I have such a longing to work that I'm as I'm astonished, as I did not expect it anymore. So it's quite amazing as much as he's worked, he still has a longing to work. And um, I kind of have that a little bit with writing. Um, you know, I've written myself basically to death. I've sweated blood, sweat and tears writing, but I do sometimes uh, miss that, um, that, that kind of productivity and that certainly that mental efficiency. I sometimes do miss that. I sometimes feel the YouTube um, environment kind of dumbs me down. What I mean by that is, I, I tended to work much harder and longer and more systematically and more carefully and more meticulously in, in a more integrated way when I wrote books. Whereas with YouTube, it, it, it's a lot more su superficial reasoning. And I think that's a little bit unfortunate. Anyway, it goes on to say, um, I will finish this letter like organs by telling you that there are certainly are signs of previous overexcitement in my words, but that is not, not surprising since everyone in this good Tarasan country is a trifle cracked. 
So here he's also saying everyone is a little bit mad. With a good handshake also for Dahan and Isaacson, I shall expect your letter as soon as possible after February 1st, ever yours, Vincent. As I said earlier, he's 35 years old at this point. He's got um, a year and a half essentially left to live. So that is it for January. There's quite few letters in February. Um, I think there's just four or five letters in February. One, two, three, four, five. So five letters in February. And then we're in March. And then Story Night is in April. So I'm going to try in Van Gogh letters. Um, what is it? 74 to to get through at least the whole month of um, February and maybe a couple of letters into March. That, that's kind of the plan. So we'll see if I can do that. Timmy definitely uses me as ASMR. I mean, his eyes are, oh, his eyes have just opened. Timmy, can you say goodbye? He definitely uses me as ASMR. Okay, let's have a look at some of your comments. Um, I must have thought there would be a couple more folks in chat, especially when I dealt with the six surprises. But it seems like Van Gogh is not uh, too many people's cups of tea in the true crime community. It's a little bit unfortunate because the Van Gogh story is also very um, a very good way to learn about subtlety, to figure out nuance. And um, I, I don't know. I don't know whether true crime is is really that good at that. As we live in a society that is very um, much focused on what is blatantly obvious and doesn't seem to appreciate subtlety that much. Snow Lion says, these letters are fascinating, but they make me quite maudlin. Well, um, if I can give you a warning, um, they're going to get extremely maudlin from here on out, um, especially when he's in the asylum. Uh, you can't really get more, more maudlin than that. Um, you know, He's not going anywhere. He's in a very um, austere environment. And I, I've got to say, I find it's almost like um, the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. Um, what is remarkable is how some people can find the resources to hope to believe in something when uh, there seems to be nothing to hope for. Um, and uh, Van Gogh has his own kind of Shawshank redemption when he's in the asylum. Um, not only does he produce certain art, and it's not like he just goes on regardless. He does, he does stumble, he does fall, he does, uh, at one point, I think he even eats some of his paint. Um, he does feel very hopeless. But the part that I think is, is really inspiring is at some point he turns a corner and um, what follows that is, is truly something to see because not a lot of people would survive what, what he'd, the trauma that he'd gone through alone and just with art as a, as a, as a consolation. Um, Zircon says, I always enjoy your analysis no matter the topic. That's that's kind of you to say. Okay, so that is it for episode 73. 
three hours 39 this this one took quite a while to get through um i do think it's quite it was quite an interesting episode i hope you guys felt the same way um some of his most interesting letters um you know i think the letters we dealt with last week maybe were slightly more um compelling but but these were also pretty interesting Okay, let's just go through a couple of your comments. You know, they say happiness is something to do. And I think if you just take life step by step and you say, I just want to improve in whatever area, just make small improvements. Can I? Uh, constant and never-ending improvement. That's something to work on. Um, and, you know, that is something you can work on. Even if it, you just improve in one particular area. Uh, thanks so much, Deborah D. from Australia. Um, I always appreciate your work and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Deborah, I believe there's a woman who went jogging in Australia who they can't find. Are you aware of that case? Mel still says thanks to the wonderful mods and chat participants. Uh, living in the Pines says I had to run errands today. I'll watch on repeat. We have pretty much come to the end of this episode. I do just want to remind you of this image. Um, let's just go to this. The woman who made Van Gogh. That is Theo. Well, this is a really long article. That is supposedly Vincent. That's one of his letters. So, you know, when we are looking at this, that's not what he wrote. You know, he didn't sit at a word processor or a typewriter. He had a, a pen in his hand and ink, and that little nib was scratching all of these words. And, you know, you've actually got to think that these letters took quite a long time to write. And this is what they looked like. And if you think about it, it's quite neat. There's not much that's crossed out. Again, that shows someone with quite a quite a lot of mental clarity, right? Just want to see if there's that that image. She was a, I think, quite a good mother. This is a page from Joe's diary. So she was also someone who, who wrote things down. The many faces of Van Gogh. Anyway, what I wanted to emphasize was if you just think about this picture, if you just look at this picture and you think about there's a time when people didn't have electric lighting, they didn't have radios, they didn't have car radios. So you didn't really have any kind of music. I'm talking about like, like we have today. Obviously, you may have folk music and the music in a church service or something. Um, but, you know, they didn't have television. They didn't have movies, right? Um, magazines were actually around already and newspapers. And But people tended to look at things like paintings, and um, at this time, photos as well. But they were, it was a much quieter society with less noise, um, less chatter, less um, useless information. And so as a result, families were closer and, and, um, 
this either led to something extraordinary, which you saw in the Van Gogh case where you had families supporting one another, um, or, um, or the opposite, Gauguin wasn't very close to his family, and of course he also succeeded, so between Gauguin and Van Gogh, I suppose you could interpret it two different ways, that you could achieve success by um, through the um, support and loyalty and kindness and charity of those close to you, or you could just uh, be very, very selfish and just do it on your own. It's just quite an interesting way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it is, is our society today that much better? When last do you see your family? How often do you talk at the table without being distracted by media? Um, you know, um, if you take all these things away, although they're very entertain entertaining and very interesting, do they really add to our lives? Because at the end of the day, Starry Night, this painting that's so celebrated, came out of this kind of environment where someone observes the sky above, um, you know, the night sky above where they are. When else did you do that? You know, aren't we very busy observing the screens in front of us, not, not things like the sky? And I don't know, there are a few things that are better at helping us see our place in the world than the night sky. <coughs> you know, just a reminder that we live in a universe that's much bigger than we um, think it is. We are part of a clock, clockwork of nature and a clockwork of the universe that is much older than we will ever be. You know, and um, you know, if we overwhelm by problems or issues, when you see it in that scale, is it really that um, overwhelming? Anyway, uh, Jalsi says the world was a better place without the internet. I must say I owe the internet a lot. I was able to make a bit of a living. Uh, if it wasn't for the internet, I'm not sure if the books I wrote would have would have sold. Uh, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Lippi, good to see you, says the sky here was amazing the other night. Good to hear. Um, the, the sky is quite hard to photograph, I must say. So I'm going to leave you guys with, I don't know whether you um, have ever watched this, but you're in luck if you haven't. I'm going to put a link in chat for a song I heard when I was in America that was really, really beautiful. And there's a, a moment in the song where you see the stars. Right? It's, a, it's called uh, San Luis, and it's actually sung by a South African who lives in America, Gregory Allen Isaacoff. Um, it's already been viewed 17 million times. Um, fantastic song, and I, and I highly recommend you listen to it. Um, I've gotten so much out of that song. It's just such a beautiful, peaceful portrait of a part of America and um, really helped make me fall in love with America when uh, when I was going through my own difficult time in November uh, last year. So please uh, watch and listen to that immediately after um, this video. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. I hope you do. Okay, thanks a lot for being here, guys. Uh, Stephanie was here earlier. Uh, Terry said that she's working, so we missed you. Jalsi, uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks to all the usual suspects. And then uh, th thanks so much for the super chats. These tend to be quite long lives, and I find them a little bit draining just because one's got to um, 
you know, it's not just a dry analysis. One, one's actually got to put your heart into it to some extent for it to be meaningful. And so it does kind of take a bit out of one. Um, you know, after doing a thing like this, I don't know if I have it in me to just go and put up uh, some other video, just because it does draw a little bit out of you. So I do appreciate those super chats. Um, and uh, I'll be back next week, right about this time for episode um, 74 and we'll then be dealing with the month of February and possibly also um, some of some of March we'll, we'll see I guess okay uh, thanks so much uh, uh, thanks so much I appreciate it um, any other comments uh, let's have a look. Theo was hoping to sell Vincent's paintings. He wanted Vincent to paint, I think. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a difficult one. I, I don't really know. I think Theo, Theo didn't really know what to do ultimately. I think he, he sort of felt um, uh, he didn't really know what to do. And so he, I think he just sort of went along with it. You must remember his brother's a force of nature. If he had said to his brother, stop painting, I, I really wonder what would have happened. Um, but, I mean, we can go into the past where that did come up and where his brother did for a period uh, apply himself in other ways. So, you know, that had kind of happened before. Okay, so that's it from me. I'm going to bid you guys adieu. Um, Mel still says hugs and wishes to everyone here. So to all the peaches, I don't know if there are any scouts here, but thanks for joining us. Um, good to see you, Michelle. Um, guys, sleep well, sweet dreams. Hope you don't have nightmares. And I'll see you guys next time.